So we begin with the refuge and bodhicitta <coughs> and go into the Guru Yoga of the Vata. Right mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. <clears throat> so we are, we are not a society. There's no membership cards. Mm -hmm. There's no inside and outside. Uh, we are participants. We're all participating, and through our participation, we give rise to what it is that we are participating in. And then when we disperse at various times and at the end, we are not participating and we are participating in something else. Uh, I like this myself. I think uh, closed institutions have lots of problems. Open institutions are better. Free flow coming and going is easy. And uh, Angela in, in the house, and she's very, very happy the way this group has been responding to the absence of the cooks and so on. People saw and acted. And that's very, very sweet. And then if you see and there's nothing to be done, you don't do anything. It's also very nice. <laughs> but if you have a position like life president or secretary, <laughs> You need to find something to do. <laughs> so this self-arising and self-dissolving, as long as there is a, a mood of supportive connectivity, that's uh, very, very easy. You don't have to have a big structure. What you have to have is the, the sense of this is, this is open and it doesn't belong to anyone else. It will, be, it will ripen and flourish with me for a while, and then it will dissolve. And whatever we do in terms of uh, books and so on, they're there for a while, and then they're gone. It's the quality of our participation that is the key thing. Not strongly grasping, not holding back, but just being with it like a surfer catching the moment of the emergent wave, catching the waves of life. Uh, so, with the three poisons, their purification in the tantric system is that mental dullness is purified as the wisdom of the Dharma Dhatu, the wisdom of the ground of everything. So that instead of there being a kind of uh, non-comprehension or misapprehension, taking things the wrong way, you see that there are no things separate from the ground. Everything is appearance and emptiness, and this is the, the realm of the Buddhas. <clears throat> from that desire, which is the, the making special of something, I have to have this is purified <clears throat> as the wisdom which appreciates each thing just as it is. It's an aesthetic appreciation. Everything in life is shape and color. The shape and color has some kind of impact. So yesterday on the stair there was a slug it had been stood on, it was there, its body was gradually losing its glow, and it was merging into the path. There's something poignant in that. When you see that, oh, poor little slug can't get out the way. A mouse could run away, but slug is stuck. We don't look, slug is dead. There we see the exquisite precision, and even if you don't formulate it in that way, there is the shape and the color. There's the stone glistening after the rain, and this body slowly dissolving, shape and color. So the exquisite details of everything are worth our attention. This is the openness of the field. When you have a distortion of this is special, I want this, then, as we've looked, some things becomes foreground, the rest recedes into the background. So the purification of desire is the appreciation of the entire field. This is the quality of the Sambhogakaya.
the purification of anger is the mirror-like wisdom. When you get angry about something, when you get irritated, it catches your attention. There is a particular kind of clarity in that. Often it's because there is some kind of disjunction. Something is not right. Somebody's throwing rubbish on the seat, or they're putting their feet on the seat, or they're talking very loudly and disturbing other people. And they don't see this, they don't recognize it, and maybe they don't care about it. And so you feel a kind of irritation. There is clarity in that. That's why its transformation is the mirror-like wisdom. It shows, oh, so there's a discordancy, like a bad sound, or something is too insistent. There's a disruption. So the mirror shows everything, but it shows it as a reflection. When you go into anger, the disruption of the field creates this impact on you and you want to retaliate, you want to come out and change it or do something, you have all these feelings. When it's held in the mirror, you're, ne you're not deaf, dumb and blind, you're not saying, oh, it's just a reflection, it doesn't matter to what, it's there. But you're also seeing whatever is the cause of this very clearly and then you have skillful response. Sometimes you should respond, sometimes you could respond very strongly or very gently. That will depend. Because the irritating event, if it again arises as foreground and the background is ignored, and you respond to that foreground event, you also get pulled into an imbalancing of the whole field. So it depends how you see the root. The root of every action that we would take as negative or provocative or annoying is an awareness of the ground, followed by solidification of experience within duality, self and other, infused with hopes and fears, winning and losing and so on. We know this. Therefore, you can act on the moment or you can act on the field. And very often, where there is hostility, it's better to act on the field. One of my uh, friends uh, is a therapist and he's uh, run several children's homes for uh, children who don't settle very well. They, they set fire to buildings, they rape other children, they're violent, nobody wants them, and so they get sent to this kind of final situation, big houses in the country where they have a lot of staff. And whenever a child acts out, maybe smears shit on the wall, or bangs someone's head on the wall, the staff have a meeting. And the staff say, this is our fault. What have we done wrong? And they they take the locus of manifestation into themselves and they say, our system is not containing, not working. So they spend time together to try to shift the ambience of the field that will allow this wave to go back into the ocean. Because once you point at the child, <clears throat> they freeze. Now you've got a bit of ice with jagged edges and people are very wary. These children have all been rejected a lot. They are the unloved, the unincluded. And so they do something. Maybe they're looking for attention and the only way they know is provocation. Whatever that background thing is, as long as they gain the specialness of being bad, they will be disruptive to the field. So the task is inclusivity not letting people get away with it, but not acting on them to further isolate them. It's a very, very beautiful approach. It costs a hell of a lot of money, <laughs> a hell of a lot of training for the staff, and a willingness not to blame. 
not to reify, not to solidify, not to concretize. So the purification of anger, if you can hold the context, then the vortex of energy that will take you into knowing you did this, you are the bad, you are the troublemaker, you can disperse that and then you have clarity. This is a moment. It's not a beautiful moment, but it's just a moment. Don't build on it. Don't uh, make it solid and separate. So, the path of desire and aversion arise in different ways in Dharma. For example, in some aspects of Chinese and Japanese Dharma, there is an attention or some kind of linking to uh, martial arts and the movement of the body, the sense that through training with other people, you can learn not to enter into anger and to learn from your own lack of balance that that is the reason you got hit. You didn't get hit because the other person's cruel or bad. Your timing was off, your balance was off. And so you keep returning to the issue of how to stay grounded, how to stay present. There's a little of that tradition in India, but not so much. Mainly in India, there was attention in the other direction to desire. So in India, we have the famous uh, Kama Shastras, various ones, especially well known as the Kama Sutra. Uh, as kind of encyclopedia of different aspects of sexual contact between men and women or men and men. Doesn't really mention women and women. And it's, so it's about desire and what is the nature of desire. So clearly most important in desire is some kind of mutual availability that two people want to get close, however close they want to get. <coughs> it's a, <coughs> excuse me, a mutual movement. In the underground in London at the moment, we have posters up saying, staring at women is an offense. Staring at women is sexual abuse. It's quite a strong message because they are not sexual objects. They are people waiting for the tube. And if you're checking them out, if you're looking at their body, people don't like that. They feel they're being hit on. In English, we say, someone's hitting on you. You think, oh. you, if somebody looks at you in a strong way, whether it's with uh, aversion or desire, and you don't want that, you feel it, don't you? There's that kind of invasion into your space. <clears throat> So, uh, generally in the tantric tradition, when they're talking about arousal, first there is the gaze. Two people's eyes catch each other and you get a buildup of the gaze and that gaze creates warmth and the warmth brings proximity, which is the second stage. And then there is the kissing embrace and then maybe there is a sexual union which would be the optimal non-separation. So that's a pathway of arousal. If you don't want that to happen, that, and somebody's doing it to you, it's clearly an attack, an invasion, because you are unavailable. Now, in the mandala system, you have four doorkeepers, four lady doorkeepers. Uh, and they, they represent the protective energy of the mandala, Za Hung Bam Ho. So the first is a kind of, the watcher is vigilant and she has a hook. Uh, and so she's looking to see any troublemakers around. And she catches them with a hook. And the second has a lasso, um, just a long rope 
with a metal ring in the end and you put it through so you get a, a loop and, she, and then from that and with that you start to have binding then you thirdly you have fetters where somebody is locked like with a iron manacles like handcuffs the hands and legs they can't move and then fourthly she has a bell she's ringing the bell ding and ding and ding and ding <laughs> it's not a nice noise you go unconscious oblivion you're paralyzed by this noise wipe out it's very interesting So when we do the meditation, we find that we are often caught by a thought. And then we have oblivion. We vanish. We don't know where the fuck we are. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> you know, again, hello. But we were carried away. So it's just like these four doorkeepers are manifesting not as the protectors of the mandala, but as the protectors of samsara. We got hooked. So the tantric symbolism is very, very helpful for alerting us. So our issue is not to get hooked. So we need to recognize the thought in the moment of its arising. not trying to control it. I mean, the tantric way <clears throat> is generally <clears throat> about power and control. We are concerned with the self-liberating of things. If the self-liberation operates if you see the inherent emptiness of what is arising. Once you concretize it as something happening to me, they're out to get me, the separated, strong existence, seeming existence of the object constellates the same structure in yourself. And so you get this ding dong. So we want to do something different. The thought is born as a thought when there is a thinker. Happening something is happening I am the one who knows something is happening so here we're very fortunate we hear these sounds we call them airplane car and so on and when we just listen no vanishing as soon as you bring this identification or oh, that's a plane you have the knower of the plane, you have your, your information bank, which you can start to project onto that. You make the plane a plane. There is no plane till you think plane. There is just this strange sound, which is arising and dissolving. So when you catch the object, the object catches you. Subject and object are born together. Which is why, in a sense, we sit like a stone. It's not, not a dead stone, but we don't want to mobilize our familiar intelligence organized around the eight consciousnesses, which allow us to name and e e evaluate and attribute meaning and function to whatever we're experiencing. We just keep it as light as possible. It's just there, which is what we were starting to do with the Vipassana. You go th down through the body and there's a happening. If you move into it, it's something is happening. And then you can add more and more information to that. Oh, this is a pain in my shoulder. That's quite an elaboration on the basis of a transient happening <clears throat> so it's exactly we are reversing the function of the four doorkeepers we are catching something which will catch us they don't get caught we get caught the dualistic mind gets caught by what it catches so we don't want to catch 
Of course, our ego self does want to catch because the ego self is marked by lack and excess. We're always hungry for something. So we are grasping something which we think will help us and it doesn't. And we do it again and again and again and again because we believe that actually it will be good. I will be fulfilled if I have this. So it has to be repeated. It has to be repeated. You take a child to the park, they show you. Do it again, do it again. You push the swing, you push the swing, push the swing. You're getting tired, you're getting a bit bored, there's something else you'd like to do. They say, do it again. One more time. Do it again. Oh, yeah, but another one more time. Maybe another one more time. What is that? <laughs> Just do it. Come on, please. It's good. No, no, please, please. Yeah. Come, bloody hell. It never comes to an end because it's this. So good. Why wouldn't I want that? Why wouldn't I want that? It's never enough. You don't get satisfaction because what you've got is a peak experience which has a downside. And when you have the downside, the best way to get out of the downside is do it again. <laughs> and it goes on and on and on. And we are just like that. And we do it with our thoughts and ideas and plans and so on. So, the capacity not to engage with the thought, to learn the thought will not fulfill me, brings you to a crossroads. I want, okay, there is a sense of lack. I want something or I want nothing. If we tilt towards I want nothing, I want to find <coughs> the open empty ground, I want to abide in the open empty ground, I want to find my non-duality from that ground, my non-difference from that ground, I want to find the aspect of my being which is open and empty, then we let go. We let go. So, say this was a wonderful crystal vase or a goblet, crystal drinking cup and somebody had put orange juice into it. I want to see it, it's beautiful. Who put orange juice in it? Why would you do that? Oh, but I like orange juice. It's a crystal goblet. It's from the 15th century. Exquisite. Look. No, but I like orange juice. That's where we're at. We want to fill it up, but what is it? You'll never see it as it is if you keep filling it. That's the issue in the practice. So we relax and release, and we very briefly experience the mind without contact, content. That's very rare. More what we're aiming for is to experience the content of the mind without either desire or aversion. Because these are the two solidifying factors which turn a wispy appearing, a happening, they turn it into the happening of something which is friend or enemy. So if we release the impetuous, the pushing energy of the five poisons, we start to see the shaping of this is how it is. And then it's gone, and it's always gone. And in that way, the, the self-liberation or the self-vanishing of thoughts allows us to be in the world with people, with emotions, with plans, going to work, raising children, whatever you're doing. These formations are non-toxic because they're not over-invested in, they're not pulled in as part of self, they're not pushed away as not part of self. They are part of the field and awareness illuminates the field. So it's always about 
letting go of the sense that I am here. As long as you have a, a central reference point that you refer back to, I exist, I'm here, this is my body. When you start from that, then there is this and that. And between this and that, there is the connection. There's subject and there's object and the connection between them. The three wheels or the three concerns that drive the production of samsaric experience. So we're sitting, happening, happening, happening. We experience it in its thickened form. Something has happened. We're not aware or conscious of how the thickening happens. But the reason for uh, study and for listening to the teaching is to become a little suspicious of what it appears to be. Like a very wise mouse who <laughs> sees cheese, mm. cheese and trap is not the same as cheese cheese. <laughs> this is cheese in the trap. Uh. And the trap is duality. So I can't have cheese as object unless I become subject, mouse in trap. Ow! So I leave the cheese, but I want the cheese. Look at the cheese. Smell the cheese. Don't eat the cheese. <laughs> So that's what we do. We, we are present with what is arising, but we don't try to grasp it. If you grasp it, it will grasp you and then tumbling on. Okay, so let's do the Guru Yoga again. So in relation to time, it's three times, linked, past, present, and future. When there's a sound and the thought arises, oh, that's a motorbike. The sound could be seemingly continuous or it could be, have, have gone. And something's arising now, a thought about that. So there's already the sense of a that. In Buddhism, we've, there's a lot of uh, exploration of the nature of dependent origination. And in the book, uh, This Is It, there's quite a, a summary of how this operates. On the basis of this, that arises. So there's a sound. The sound is already vanishing. On the basis of this, the thought arises, that is a motorbike. Ordinarily, we're thinking that thought has as its referent, the thing it refers to, the sound. That is a motorbike. I'm making a conjunction between the sound and the interpretive thought. But if you see them as dependent in origination, but neither completely different nor completely the same, then there is the sound 
and the thought and both arise and pass. So you don't have to block the thought when you're sitting in the practice trying not to think about what's happening. That would be crazy. The thought arises. It's a motorbike. Stay with the thought. It vanishes. The sound vanishes. The thought vanishes. The sensation in your back vanishes. Everything which arises vanishes in the moment where it is, which is the Dharma Datu. Sometimes the Dharma Datu is very, very small. If you're sitting quietly reading something, the Dharma Datu is just a circle around your feet. You just, this is all there is, like a child completely immersed. You say, come on, we've got to get to school. No. In that, that's the entirety of their world. And then they're up and now they're looking around. So the, the sphere in which things arise has no height or depth or beginning or end or side. Sometimes it looks very big, sometimes it looks very small. It has no dimension. It's incredible, beyond belief, beyond understanding. It's a plane. The sound tells me it's a plane. That's a linking interpretation. The thought is arising about something. The sound is vanishing. The idea of the plane is vanishing. The mind is now filled with something else. There was sound and thought and maybe some feeling And they come together. So that's the fourth skanda that we've touched on quite a lot, which is the compositional activity. Creating a package, like taking the bits of Lego and bringing them together and making a boat or a plane or a castle. The, boat, the things themselves, the particles of Lego, they don't have any inherent boatness or plainness or castleness. When you put them together, you have the gestalt formation, oh, it's a castle. And the concept of castle is like an invisible keystone, like when you build an arch, you, you know, you put wooden supports and you put the stones and then you drop this angled stone in the middle and it locks the two sides so that the arc becomes self-supporting. So the thought, it's a castle. <laughs> look at my castle. Mom, come in, look, look what we did. Got a castle. And the what the castleness of the castle is our shared ability to project castleness into it and agree this shape is called a castle. Yeah. Some of you know this story very well from the old text, the Melinda Panho, the questions of King Melinda, in which he asks this monk to explain to him uh, the absence of inherent existence or dependent origination. And the monk says, great king, call your servants and ask them to bring out your wooden chariot. They bring out the chariot. Your majesty, ask your servants to take out the wooden pegs because they used wooden nails to hold the parts in place. They take out these. Now lay out the pieces of the chariot. Now on the ground there's a huge array of different shaped bits of wood. Your majesty, where is your chariot? I don't have a chariot. It's gone. Now, Your Majesty, ask your servants to put the, the parts together and put in the wooden pegs. Oh, here's my chariot. That is the absence of inherent existence. The term chariot, the concept chariot, the felt sense, oh, I can get on my chariot tie on the horses and off we go. This is a chariot. Is intelligent 
and profoundly stupid simultaneously. It's intelligent because now you have a chariot you can use and you can do all of this, but it's stupid because you've forgotten the fact that this is a construct. You have moved from observing a process of juxtaposition, of placing next to each other these parts that have brought into being a shape which is dependent, produced, but the application of it's a chariot somehow wipes out history and it is as if this is a self-existing form. So interesting. We see it if you bake bread or you make an omelette cooking, you're doing it all the time. You've got the ingredients, you've got the cooking process, and then you've got biscuits or a cake or a curry. Oh, that's what it is. It's a curry. And the cooking process is somehow vanished because the product seems to be something in itself. So you can observe that again and again and again. I often think, you know, when we uh, come up with something like a book, this book is tears and sweat and rage and horror. <laughs> this took a very, very long time to do. It was a pleasure working with the actors, but dealing with the printer and getting the colors run and getting the guy who was setting it up for printing, a bit of a nightmare. But it's a book. I know the history, but you see a book. The book is cut. So the ground is invisible, the root is invisible, and it's a free-floating object, something in itself. It's a commodity in the world that you can buy, but actually this is the flowering of a process. So this is, in a sense, what you might call the false present. It is the decontextualized present which gives the illusion of separated things. And everything we see, whether it's the shape of the hills or the trees that are growing there or the roads that are moving along the pathways, all of this has arisen due to causes and conditions. It's very difficult anywhere in Europe to find wild forest that hasn't been influenced. Even if human beings haven't influenced, there have been forest fires in the past, there's been the Ice Age, there have been all kinds of forces which have given rise to the particular formations, what we call natural. Uh, natural gives also the sense of being born. Yeah, they're, they're kind of uh, organic processes, but they're very much in the sequence of cause and effect. So. The reason for trying to lay this out before you is that when you grasp something, its graspability is delusion because it's arising and passing. It's in a process. When a wave's coming, it's moving, the surfer wants to catch the wave or even if you're just launching your body onto the wave, woo, you go with the wave, you catch the wave. You don't catch it. Align yourself with it in some ways. The wave is uncatchable. Time is uncatchable. So when the thought arises in the mind, and it seems to be something you can take hold of, this is delusion. It's a, it's a moment in a process and what you're seeing is a product which has been given a self-arising nature. So, <clears throat> excuse me, when you look in the text, in the Tibetan text, they're often using this term rang jum. Rang means self, jum means to arise. So Padma Sambhava in Tibetan is Pema, which means Lotus Padma. Jungne, Jung means to arise and Ne means the place. So the, the lotus is the place where Padmasambhava arises. Jungwa to arise. So Rang Jung means arising by itself. Arising by itself means there is nothing caused. 
he is inseparable from ground emptiness. Actually, everything is inseparable from ground emptiness. Everything is illusion. It is uncaused. But when you see something which, in relative truth terms, is caused, and you deny that it's caused because it's just that, <clears throat> then you're stupid. Do you like my new shoes? The shoe is a manifestation of a process, of a factory, often in a hot country, often with quite young children involved in making it, often with chemicals in the air of its trainers because it's hot plastics and so on. We don't want to know that. Then you have campaigning groups who are saying, you know, ethical production, ethical clothes in Bangladesh and so on, and the factories want to lock the door and not let anyone see what's going on. So it's, oh, what a nice t-shirt, as if it's just floating in through the sky. <laughs> but there's a lot of danger and, and suffering inside, and the bosses are making a big profit, and workers are not paid so well. That's what Karl Marx wrote about, mystification and false consciousness. The worker cannot understand why they're poor and the boss is rich. Because if you don't understand creaming, taking the profit, you don't understand what's going on. The shareholders get the profit and the workers get paid. And these are two completely different systems. So if you're not invested, if you're not a shareholder and you have no share of the profit, you just get your wage, which is set at a low level in order to increase the profit so that you give more money to the shareholders, so more people will invest, so you build more factories. It's a whole dynamic system. But if you don't get it, it's like a mystery. How are some people poor and some people rich? We are working really hard and we don't have anything. How is that possible? <clears throat> because there's a, a blindness. There's a false consciousness that says, oh, it's just like this. And everybody's okay, it's just like this. And then you bring in a critique, that mystification, which is not understanding how it happens. I remember when I was about 11 in the end of my primary school, we had a little inquiry group to find out about how babies are made. <laughs> so, we, we, were, we were all going into the, the shelf at home where there would be a family encyclopedia and looking up these things and then discussing how you do that and what it is. You know, <laughs> this kind of pre-puberty mystery. <laughs> Just don't get it. How would that be? Why would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> So that's what the mystification is. You just, you just don't get it. <laughs> so again and again, hopefully you can see that all the different levels of Dharma go in the same direction. They feed into each other. Whatever you learn in what might be called the outer Dharma is incredibly useful. If you enter into Mahamudra on its own, unless your mind is very quick and you're very at ease in yourself, it gets difficult. You just end up feeling stupid because you can't do it. And of course you can't do it because it's not something you do. So the paradigm shift from this is my life, it's up to me, I've got to make it happen, into everything is the sahaj, the immediate spontaneous <laughs> emergence of the ground. It's, it's a very big leap. And that's why the study of impermanence, absence of inherent self-nature, dependent origination, they become a kind of massage or loosening up that allows you to see, oh yeah, what is this world? These are plants out there and they've grown through time according to the seasons whether they got water or not. Everything is process, everything is flow. My mind is flow, but I'm grasping at things as if they were there. So the grasping is the way of maintaining the stupidity that there, there are really existing entities, separate phenomena. 
I'm doing this. And then you can start to observe how you do that. What is the status of a thought? Until this morning, in my bowl, I put some fruit and some porridge. And I looked at the yogurt and I thought, you've eaten so much cheese in this place. You don't usually eat a lot of cheese. <laughs> Why would you add yogurt? Then there's all the cheese. Mm -hmm. Porridge is fine. <laughs> so there you see, oh, that would be nice. For whom? Not for we fat me, it would not be good. Good for Mr. Tongue, not so good for Mr. Belly. And Mr. Back starting to say, oi, oi, oi. <laughs> so, internal conversation, internal family therapy. <laughs> Tongue, what would you like to say? I would like that. <laughs> Belly, oh, I've had enough. Got to digest all the stuff. Oh, my God. <laughs> It's like that, isn't it? So something, if you went just with the habit, you would take it and you'd eat it and you quite enjoy it. But you can put in a, a comma in there. You can have a, a slight pause. Why? Well, it's nice. Is that sufficient reason? I, I could eat it. Yes, could. Is that sufficient reason? And then you realize that there are pathways or tendencies, you can call them karmic pathways or habit formations, which bring a kind of givenness or correctness or this, this is just meanness into it. And you find yourself in something without needing to, like smoking a lot or drinking or whatever it would be, reading a lot at, late at night, not doing your exercise, whatever it would be. So there we see an outer form of I give myself to the thought and the thought catches me. So back with the four doorkeepers in the mandala, and there's drawings of them in the me first book, they are trying to catch those who will invade the mandala. They're saying, don't let that thought come in, because once the thought's in, oh yes, it's on your plate. What's on my plate? I should eat it. I don't want to waste the food. That would be very bad. Oh, it's not bad. Oh, God, I feel sick. <laughs> because there is a disjunction. So if you catch the thought, you can at least have a pause in which you see it. It has a momentum, and the momentum is twofold. One is emotional. I'd like it. And the other is a slightly deeper structure that because the ego is empty, it, it, it lacks any form or structure of itself. It has to, to absorb elements of the field in order to take on an identity. And so there is a, under the power of unawareness of the ground, and the development of the false identity, I am self-existing, I am myself, <clears throat> that lie disguises the fact that I am an interactive moment in this ever-changing field. I'm not even really a polarity, because I'm not fixed in any way. I'm just a movement swirling with other swirling movements. I'm like a little whirlwind, a little vortex in a field of vortices, moving and moving and swirling, ever-changing. I have no fixed shape. Turn that into a positive statement. I am pure potential. I have no fixed shape. I could go anywhere. This is the possibility. We can emerge <clears throat> in so many ways. That's why we have the peaceful and wrathful deities, the different forms of Tara and so on. But the ego says, <laughs> I exist. You can't exist as pure potential. 
Potential is before the fact. It's emergent with the other. I exist. I have an independent existence, not organized by the patterning of what's happening out there. And that's the lie. That is the delusion of being separate. You're constantly having to mislead yourself to the fact that you get pulled into things because you're part of the pulsation of emergence. You are co-emergent and not an autonomous entity. So there's a lot of self-deception involved in that. Just like a wee drink. Yes. No, I do have a wee drink. Yeah. Most evenings, but only every evening actually. Sometimes at lunch. Just a wee drink, half a bottle, or only sometimes a bowl, sometimes two. <laughs> I'm not an alcoholic. No, it's a choice. I love it. And many, many, if you work in the field of addiction, you get these stories again and again. I define me. I'm not defined by this. That's free. I could I could stop any time. I just why could I stop it? I love it. Self-deception is right at the heart of it. We don't exist as someone. We are not a thing. We are not a separate entity, but we believe we are. And that delusion as functional self-deception creates havoc in our free articulation in the world because we're trying to hang on to shapes which are dissolving. We are not who we think we are. When we had um, the forced retirement due to collapsing companies, redundancy, the rate of, of, of suicide was very high, heart attacks was very high, the rate of cancers rose as well in the shipyards in Scotland because people lost their sense of identity. They imploded, their diets got worse, they, ab they felt abandoned by the factory they'd worked with and they abandoned themselves. And that certainly happened in uh, areas of Poland where there was a very strong interaction with the state organizations. If you're not trained to be independent, <coughs> entrepreneurial, finding your way, when the carapace, when the, when the shell around you dissolves, it's just very, very tender, raw experience that's arising. And that led to many problems. So having a stable sense of personal identity, having a sense of this predictability about the future, uh, what therapists sometimes call object constancy, which is either internalized images of the other or indeed factors in the field that there's a secure attachment, I can rely on this and therefore I can build an extension of myself into the future and because of that there's not too much turbulence on the horizon and I can settle and relax and I feel grounded, I feel secure. For many, many people in the world that's a complete delusion, it's unavailable. And so the the delusion that I know who I am, I am this reliable person, I will always be like this, when that starts to shift and get, sh and get shaken, it's very, very disturbing. Life will be very, very hard for all these people who have left Ukraine to come into another country, to have to le earn another la learn another language, not to have your qualifications recognized to be full of longing and misery, to feel guilty and bad when people you know are still there. <clears throat> so many movements of identification and confusion are there. So from the Dharma point of view, we have a chance in calm times to look at it. If you want to have money in the bank when a crisis occurs, you have to put money in the bank when the sun's shining. You can't put money in the bank in a storm because you're already handing out your money to deal with the storm. So it's exactly that in meditation. 
If you wait till the wolf comes, it's too late. You have to make preparations. And that's what we do in our practice. We release ourselves from our false identifications, relax into the unborn openness, and do our best to stay at ease in that and avoid the hooks into deceitful construction which appears necessary and yet is not. That's the heart of our work. Okay, let's take a half hour break. The human situation is vulnerable. Okay, I have two questions actually. Uh, the first one concerns something you said about uh, the actual meditation. And uh, at least I heard it that way. You say the uh, actually experiencing the open mind without content is quite rare and only for a very short lasting time. And then the, there is a lot of emergence in, of the content of the mind. So I would like to understand that if I'm sitting and there is, like in an opera, there is a stage with all the props being set up, like the flowers, and mm -hmm. you are there, everybody's there, but they are basically not moving their appearances of color and shape, mm -hmm. as you say, and nothing comes up above that. It's just just this. And, and then, of course, there is uh, a lot of thoughts that can come up within this setting. So is there any place here already not to have the content of the mind or is it still, even if it's not moving, the content of the mind and the, the experience of not having the content would be entirely different of, from that? I mean, the, <clears throat> the general uh, a teaching on this is the inseparability of wisdom and compassion. Wisdom is the, the ground of everything is empty, it has no content of its own, and compassion is the ceaseless flow of arisings, which could be Sambhogakaya, Nimanakaya, both. So, if you're sitting and there's nothing happening at all, that's probably not a very healthy experience. You're, you're dazed out, you're disassociated, maybe depersonalized, and it would be uh, it would be a state of lostness. So like they describe in the first level of ignorance when it's arising, it's called uh, Drenme. Drenba means uh, recollection, sometimes means memory, but it can also mean just here, like a kind of presence, Drenba. Here I am, um, a, a non-dislocation. If that's not there, you have a kind of oblivion. So for most people, they don't have much light when they sleep. So if, you, if the meditation becomes like falling asleep and there's just nothing there, then you wake up. That would not be helpful at all. So we don't, we don't need more oblivion. We need less oblivion. Uh, so the middle way is between nothing at all, annihilation, nihilism, vanished, and involved, enmeshed, constructive. Okay. The second one concerns, uh, you use a lot the term of uh, uh, coming and going, or uh, appearing and vanishing. So somehow it appears as if the, let, let's say, about the sound, you hear the airplane and say this is a vanishing experience. It seems like a, like you would use the, the word vanishing in a double meaning because uh, obviously if, you have, if I have a sustained sound, it doesn't vanish. But somehow in it is still some kind of vanishing. And can you say about that something? Was I clear? What? Yeah, no, it's clear. Uh, like, like if you bang a gong, then there is a sustained sound. Obviously, it doesn't vanish. 
Mm-hmm. You, you hear it, you hear it, you hear it, you hear it. Mm-hmm. But somehow, what you say it seemed to imply that the, even within the, that sustained sound, there is a kind of vanishing. Well, with the gong, because it's a vibration, you have oscillation of sound. Mm-hmm. So you have uh, intensification and, and less intensity as, as the very nature of sound, because sound is vibratory. So it, it is not constant, but it appears to be constant. So in terms of outer impact, it is constant, but it had, it's uh, on the, resting on, on fluctuation. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but the vanishing of it would be at the end when it goes. Most sounds, most experiences are actually shifting. Mm-hmm. But the, the, the kind of, the, the, the key point is not so much that it vanishes, but that it vanishes by itself. So it arises, as it were, by itself. So you can say, here is a gong, I hit the gong, I made the sound. If I hadn't hit the gong, there wouldn't be a sound. The sound is not self-arising. But the sound emerges on, due to causes and conditions. These causes and conditions are themselves arising on the basis of causes and conditions. So you have an infinite regression exploring all the factors which gave rise to that possibility. Thich Nhat Hanh wrote many, many things about this, that it looks as if there's me, there's the, the stick, and here's the gong, and these three come together, and now here is the sound. But the one holding the stick has a whole history of causal sequences. The stick was made, the gong was made in a factory. There's a conjunction of coming here together, which is cut off. So inside the frame that I'm doing this, I, I'm the causal agent, and these are the causal utensils, and due to this, the sound arises. But when you open the framework, how would you find the, the, the beginning of this process of the movement of the sound? So in that sense, it doesn't have an, an identifiable beginning, and it emerges. When it emerges, if you stay with the sound itself and you don't tell yourself the interpretive story about this, stay with the phenomena, and there's this, and then it's gone. We are so used to relying on interpretation as the way in which we clarify what's going on. So I hit the gong with the stick and there is sound. That's a story I'm telling myself. That helps me to organize and function in the world. Now I like the gong. I go back to my town, I go to the shop where they sell gongs, I try out various gongs, I like this gong. So I'm creating a relationship with gong as something which I can activate and produce some sounds that I like. But the sound itself, in the moment of its emergence, you can interpret it in its causal sequence, and in terms of relative truth, that is true. In terms of the sound itself, as it arises, is the sound the same as the gong and the the striking stick, or different? It's, it says you get this discussion from, in this book, uh, uh, this is it. You get the discussion from the Garjuna quite briefly about um, is the next moment the same or different from the preceding moment? When, when you die, is the next life a continuation of this life or is it a new life? If it was a new life, there would be nothing carried across. If it was the same, it wouldn't be a new life. 
it is there is a modification on the way but you can't say precisely what that relation is that's nagarjuna's conclusion so on relative terms we say the gong and the stick create the sound but given that the sound doesn't look like the gong doesn't look like the stick doesn't look like the tension in your arm it it has a relationship which is in some ways miraculous you know you can analyze it but the the immediacy of its uh, arising the thisness of it to locate that bright immediacy to the causal sequence one is an abstracted conceptual mapping and the other is a sudden eruption of a particular territory so it's quite a, in buddhist philosophy there's a lot of discussion about the relation of these things for our purpose in meditation we try to ease ourselves out of this pattern of past present and future as a linked movement to just this just this just this not by cutting off the past but by not linking the past because in mahamudra and in sokshen they would say whatever occurs is unconstructed it is uh, unprepared it is unelaborated it's raw it's just this and so the weaving of the three times that is a a constructive activity if you don't do the constructive activity you see the immediacy the immediacy is not produced by the constructive activity but we are so used to the analysis of the construct that it appears that that's the basis so that's why we have in science this huge capacity to explain everything uh, but actually the world is full of wonder the world is full of surprises you could say the surprise arises from ignorance and probably research scientists would say well yeah that's <laughs> you've got to join the dots it's the joining of the dots that shows you how it is but when you look directly at your mind in this moment this is what's arising it's arising fresh and when you see the freshness of it it's the first it's the original never before each moment is virginal it's not dependent on anything else when you put it in the sequence then it is clearly dependent so things are both dependent and unique depending on the on the point of view now of course well hang on what does it mean the point of view in the Nyingmapa system we have nine yanas or nine styles of practice and each of them has their own view even inside the ninth level ati yoga or zokshin there are different kinds of views this view mediated through treacher and through turgel and you have a different approach they're saying it is how you see it it is how you see it some of how you see it is how it is and some of how you see it is as if that's how it is <laughs> some is seeing with imagination and some is naked seeing so that, but we're always seeing we are always viewing we are always either world plus me or world alone or me alone very rare to have me alone very rare to have world alone but in the in the practice that's what we're trying to do to not meld not to merge me and world otherwise you simply have the continuity of your interpretation but it's a very interesting area to see for yourself if i don't tell the world what it is what is it which is the basis for a great deal of um, chan and zen practice that uh, what was your face before you were born it's, it's exactly 
to be born, to come into the world of signifiers, is already to wrap things in the conceptual interpretation. The unborn face is a face to which interpretation can't be applied. What is it? What is it? Actually, we have it all the time. That is the medium we are operating in, but we are unborn born. You're born into the unborn as unborn, and you're born, which is appearance and emptiness. But if you don't have the, I'm going to say the flavor of emptiness, it's not a flavor, it's not a taste, it's not a color, it's not anything. If you have the ungraspability of emptiness ignored, then you have the graspability of appearance severed from emptiness. It's never severed, it's a delusion. But that's what you get. And then you get the building up of all these entities and analysis, and so many machines for showing things. So I remember in school when we were doing chemistry, the, the chemistry teacher got very excited. We got this new machine that was doing chromatography and it would turn around and the colors of the chemicals would be kind of splayed out. And then he's saying, this color is copper. This color is... <laughs> we believe you. We want to pass the exam. <laughs> How would you know? That's just the, that, you know, that's a conceptual patterning that comes up. This and this indicates that. It's a diagnostic system. Signs. There you go. No. I oh, you need the dude. You need yeah. the... Please. The doodah. The doodah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, you just said that um, we can make a difference between the, 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 the not get fused with the world, yeah, the experience. So I have to, but I, then it means like there is a kind of dualism which I experience while uh, trying <coughs> to meditate, though there is still the sense of me, even if I don't have a thought which defines myself, but I have the experience of my body sitting there, being trying to do something, mm -hmm. trying to do nothing, yep. maybe. <laughs> um, so, but there is still the sense there is a, there is a thought coming, yep. and there is someone who experiences the thought coming. Yep. And who does uh, of the realizing of, oh, yeah, there's a thought coming. I mean, even without naming it, but there's still the kind of a dual, duality mm -hmm. of the one sitting and the one experiencing something. Even I can see it's part of the mind, the thought still, it's, uh, it's, a, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, 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 an, uh, it's something which arises in the mind, still I have the feeling of, uh, if, even if it's a separation of body and mind, mm -hmm. and the duality, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. a, but of course, the yeah. duality becomes more fixed uh, very quick. Mm -hmm. So the traditional uh, way of looking at this is to take the example of the musk pod. This is a little pod that grows on the belly of the musk deer, and hunters take it off and it has very strong smell, it's the smell of musk that's in many modern perfumes. And they say if you put it in a box, when you take the musk pod out of the box, the, the box will continue to smell of musk for a long time. There is no objective cause of the smell of the musk, but this subtle trace is lingering there. In, in Tibetan they call it a bakcha. It's um, yeah, it's like a the trace of somebody smokes a lot of cigarettes. You go into their house a week after they stop smoking, you can still find the trace smell of the of the cigarettes of the tobacco. So, because although the mind itself is space, because of the um, experience of being a substantial person. It is as if we are a thickened medium which then carries traces for longer. In these uh, experiences that Andreas is describing, these are like the traces 
which become the the ground of how I am proceeding into the next moment. So the ground of the traces or the trace ground if you like this is what's called the eighth consciousness in Tibetan it's called Kunji Namparshepa, the consciousness which is the ground of all. And all here means all things, all reified phenomena. Uh, it's a term which has a long history and was uh, interpreted in different ways. So in the Lankavatara Sutra, it's described as being the storehouse consciousness. So it's as if every moment of life leaves a subtle trace. In general uh, ethical terms we talk of this as karma and the karma ripens. So the eighth consciousness was a way of uh, thinking okay where is it stored? So when you die and the sense consciousnesses dissolve into mental consciousness and the afflictive consciousness, the five poisons consciousness dissolve into mental consciousness and it vanishes there is still this uh, subtle trace which continues through time. On which vehicle? Mm -hmm. On which vehicle? I mean, when, on which vehicle it, it continued? Sure. On which vehicle? Yeah. yeah. So, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. The question is on which vehicle it continued because then it. Uh, Dissolves in emptiness. Yeah. Emptiness couldn't store anything. Exactly, exactly. So the the ego is um, it, it's like the insubstantial made substantial. So when you have appearance at emptiness, like the reflection in the mirror, when the when you move the object in front of the mirror, the reflection vanishes and there's no trace. If you have a cushion and you sit on the cushion, when you get up, there's a, an indentation, there's a trace because you have impacted it, it has absorbed it. And of course, if you, if you draw on a piece of paper, even if you rub it out, the surface is abraded and then you can see something's been rubbed out. So it's always like, what is the, what is the medium of my presence? There is a thickening. No, unawareness is a thickening of presence. So I'm here and it feels like me. It's that sense of you're sitting and without doing anything or anything at all, you do the ah, here I am. And the here I amness seems like a given. It seems intrinsic. It seems to be something you just will never get rid of. So then there are a whole sequence of practices for trying to dissolve this. For example, the pet we did a little of, which is one of the 18 semzins, the 18 ways of seeing the mind as it is. So by engaging in an intense experience, which gives a, a dense sense of something happening, and then you stop. The after effect of that allows a moment in which the subtle trace is there and then it's gone. And it's by observing the subtle trace that you see how the movement into the next moment is sustained. It's like, um, like a pontoon bridge. You know when they have the like barrels and then you put some wood on top of them and if you walk over it's going up and down. The barrels are the things supporting you and the, the, the wood on top is a bit loose because it has to rock with the barrel. So as you go from one substance to the next, this kind of linking over is like the trace and it doesn't vanish. So. As you accumulate that from lifetime to lifetime, I, I am me, I exist, I exist. The delusion of, of existence continues. It's, 
it's difficult to find very precise examples for this. I mean, for example, um, late teens, early 20s are quite a strong period for the arising of psychosis. Mm -hmm. Apart from drug-induced psychosis, it's a time when very often there's a some psychotic turn. You also get late onset psychosis, but that's a bit different. So somebody's maybe a bit troubled at school or a little bit on the edge or a bit too ambitious or a bit overloaded. It often happens with peop uh, boys who've been specializing in abstract studies like mathematics and physics. They get to university and they find the social interactions difficult. They find they're not as intelligent as they were and something seems to trigger and they have a psychotic breakdown. It's always a, an incredibly important moment because it's not clear whether this is the beginning of a lifetime of psychosis or whether it's a, an interlude. Why it becomes a lifetime pattern, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure that it's clear in, in uh, bio, uh, biological terms, in terms of shifts in brain functioning. There's a lot of scan research going on. But somehow there's, somebody could have a kind of blip and then come back. Or they could be in a whole new identity in which they have to take very heavy medication, have periods of hospitalization, and gradually become estranged from who they were, estranged from their friends, estranged from what was imagined as their life trajectory. And they're in a kind of un, un, less fulfilling pathway of life. So these eruptions into life, these would be seen as something embedded in this ground consciousness which arises. So our sense of who we are is, a, is, is, is always dynamic. We're always prone to various factors coming in. Now we see with COVID, this thing they call long COVID. COVID has gone, but the after effects can last a long time. There was years and years of analysis and discussion and fighting all about uh, the status of ME. You know, are these people frauds? Are they cheating? Are they trying to, you know, avoid getting back to work? What is it? Very difficult to establish. Somebody's saying this is, this is how it is. So how we are formed, what the basis of what seems possible for us arises for us. So you see that with children. Sometimes, you know, you, you want to help a child learn to swim and they say, no, no, no. Come on, look, your brother's swimming. Come on, we're all going in the water together. No, 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 no. And for whatever reason that you can't establish that they don't know, <laughs> they just don't want to go into the water. Go to the beach, you often see that. The kids, you know, they splash their feet and then they go back. They don't want to go in. So... You could interpret that in all sorts of ways, but that would be an example of a kind of trace positioning which, which is influencing whether somebody's available or not, whether you're open to a subject at school. You could do something, but you don't want to do it. Or you try a musical instrument for a while and then you give up on it because it doesn't feel like you. And this, So there are different levels of feels like me. But the most basic one is I exist. And that's like the, the deep trace of the musk pod in the deer. When you look for it, you don't find anything substantial, and yet it arises in you. Here I am. When you look for, okay, what is the real basis of me being me? You think of your history, da da da, da da da, da. you can see. Well, that's not really me. That's not really me. That's not really me. So what am I? Well, I am this moment of identification with certain factors which are emerging in the field. 
And so it's that kind of dynamic emergence which we experience in the meditation. You sit to practice and you get this kind of echo body. So, in the description of going into the bardo, they talk about at first you have a kind of echo body which has the shape of the body you have in this life and then gradually that body dissolves and you get an echo body which is predictive of the body you're going to get in the next life. In uh, Hindu uh, philosophy you get a lot of discussion of these different kinds of bodies, Akashic layers, <coughs> you know, seventh layer out of the potential of the person in from the very subtle into the kind of condensed embodied layer here. So my sense, Andreas, would be that it's it's like that, that you have you have a trace which if you were able to just stay with it, you'd be able to see the dissolving of it. But because it feels to us like self-proving, okay, this is me. And the, the egoic bit of us wants to be me, you get this kind of devil's marriage between the continuity of the ego and the potential of the situation. We say a drowning man will clasp at a straw. Mm -hmm. So the dissolving of self, you grasp onto something and it could be anything. Yeah. No. I often used to have the experience I'm sitting and there's some sort of dull pain where, or not, not a pain, but a sort of dull sensation at the back of what I would take to be my head, and that would be me. <laughs> <laughs> not very bright and shiny. This is me. And then it would go. But it was like any port in a storm that the ego's desire to continue mean and its actual hollowness allows it to identify with anything that's occurring. Does that make sense? So the way out of this is to dissolve it. So with this eighth consciousness, the consciousness which is the ground of everything, uh, Sialama always used to say when we were translating texts around it that it's dumache, it is uncompounded. It's actually non existence, <coughs> existent, but it appears to be compounded. So when you have this ground of everything, the alaya, as the false basis of all existence, when you actually see that it is uncompounded, you see that it's like a, a disordered manifestation of the actual ground, the kunshi, which is the, the basis of samsara and nirvana. And the difference is the the interplay of the subtle subject and object feeling mm -hmm which gives the sense that there's something there. Because there's no object without a subject. If there is a perceived, there has to be a perceiver. It's not a thing. So when I'm sitting in the practice and this is me, and I don't think I'm doing it, I'm making it, I'm not trying to have this, it's just there. There is a seer of the just there. So this is an object for the subject. And in the in the Zokshan path, we're trying to dissolve the subject more. In the Mahamudra path, sometimes we're trying to dissolve the object more. Either way, it is the open Dharma Datu, which is the ground of both subject and object as illusory phenomena. Both are illusory. Due to unawareness of the actual ground, the first arising of the ground appears to be something. So we have to again and again dissolve. Energetically using the pet, with devotion into the mandala of Padmasambhava, 
with relaxation into the openness that doesn't uh, reify or solidify whatever is happening. But these subtle traces are very, very difficult to deal with because they just seem to be there. You open the, the wooden box and you smell the musk. There's nothing there. The smell is there. It's just there. How come it's there? So that's this subtle feeling tone of existence. It has been generated by experience after experience after experience of dualistic interpretation. But now this afterglow or this shadow or this ghost or echo trace seems to be self-existing. And because it's subtle, only truly open awareness can allow it to dissolve. As long as your awareness is constellated towards a subjectivity, even that subtle subjectivity will confirm the existence of the subtle object and then you get back into the whole movement again and again. Which is why uh, we have all kind of yoga systems of breathing, which is exactly this, to bring the two side channels, which are the subtle uh, maintainers of subject and object as interactive forms, to bring them into the Avaduti central channel, the channel of emptiness, and so they resolve there. So you breathe them in, bring them in, lock them with a kumbhaka, and with force, you do that enough. If you have the energetic system that will allow you to do that, you get some relief. Or you can do it through increasing pleasure sensations and so on. But it's, uh, it's something I think that everybody experiences, this kind of shadow of existence. Mm -hmm that's sort of lurking there in the background. It's like the, they have some of these books about the, uh, I can't quite remember the name, but this cabal of the Illuminati who are in the background and they're pulling all the strings in the world and making things happen. Putin's fantasy about the Nazis in Ukraine doing all these bad things. So this, this hovering ghosty form and it becomes functional if you believe in it. That's what we were looking at earlier. That the thought is energized by the belief in the thought. So thoughts themselves have no substance. The thought becomes a thought. The thought is born as a thought by the belief in the thought. So thought potential is thought and emptiness and arising and emptiness and appearance and emptiness. But once you apprehend it, oh God, I'm thinking about that again. Huh? The grasping, the merging, the apprehending invests life energy, libido, into the thought, and it takes on a form. So the insubstantial gains substance as an energy impact, because you believe in it, you take it seriously. So that's why the saying, whatever arises, leave it alone, and it dissolves. If you get involved through either desire or aversion, both of these are kind of energy transfer system, because you wouldn't need to avoid something if it wasn't dangerous. So you've already given a, a cognitive reading to the status of this object. You want to avoid it, and that avoidance makes it stronger. Like in a school, the the boy who's trying to avoid being bullied, by avoiding the bully, is setting up a dynamic in which the bully can see that they have power over the boy, because the boy looks fearful. Don't touch me. Leave me alone. That's my bag. So the retraction is paradoxically informing the action of the other. Mm 
Does that seem to make sense? Okay, any other thoughts or questions? Okay, oh, quite a lot. May I have the microphone? Yeah. Oh. Um, when you're in this meditation and the thoughts are not too much there, maybe they're not there, there's still or there's a vibration that comes when you look around or when you look the, the solidity of what you see starts to vibrate and um, for me there's an experience of that even though there is no thought at all, there's still interpretation because we are human beings and so, so we see this in a way we see because there is some interpretation of what is coming up directly that brings me to the question, how is this connected to the idea of, of the Lundrock, of spontaneously arising? Because there seems to be a kind of process for the world is the way that we, we perceive it, even though we don't interpret it in a way uh, that we do with thoughts. Well, Lundrock would be the whole field infinite space, immediately filled by whatever it is. So you turn and look one way, whoa, whoa. Each, everywhere you go, suddenly there is this. You don't have the sense of constructing it. And so these colors or vibrations or whatever it is, that is part of the quality of the emergent field in that moment. Why it's like this in that moment, we don't know. This is just how it is. The key thing that the text is saying is, if you see the ground is empty, everything that arises is empty. And then you know what it is. It's the radiance of emptiness. If, if that's not a living experience, then questions arise. What is it? Why did it come for? What does it mean? And then you get hooked back into thought. So whatever's arising, in this moment, it's in a sense, it's the, it's the realm of clarity, that is to say, um, luminosity. These, this is the kind of radiance of color, shapes, without them being formulated as such, ceaselessly arising and passing. So we can stay with that without having any theory of why or human or this or that we find that we move in relation to other people when we get up from the meditation, still within the realm of clarity. So everything is open and clear. And moment by moment, we have posture, gesture, speech acts, and so on. But none of them establishes anything because these are modes of expression in the field of light. So when you're just sitting, the, the field of light is kind of shimmery and not very established. And you get up and you start talking to someone, you see their face, how they are around the eyes. It's not actually thickened, but you've got, you, you've got a, um, there's an intentionality of connectivity which creates a different tonal quality to what's there. So if you, if you walk along the, the edge there, there are many different leaves. If you stop and you just look at one leaf, it starts to reveal more because you're giving it more attention. So it's the same as we proceed into the world. It's, it's the quality of attention linking aspects of the field which gives rise to the, this kind of shininess of this particular moment. If that is just in the emptiness and we let it go and there's no trace, that's one thing. But if I think, well, this is really nice, I like talking with you, let's talk again and later, it starts to subject an object, uh, you get a condensation because now I'm hanging on to the echo of the conversation we had and that becomes a, a, something I can build on. 
but the actual moment, there's nothing to build on. So in a sense, mm -hmm. it's trusting Hlundrup as ceaselessness. They say it's unobstructed. So I don't need to hang on to this moment because there'll be another moment. But if this is a special moment, and I might never see you again, and I really need to do, me, talk with you about this, then this moment is extrapolated. It's as if it's taken out of the situation and given a, a, an enduring different status. You are special for me. And that's, that's what then becomes problematic because then you don't get the vanishing and then you don't get the, the space within which new f forms are arising and passing. We have to ask this question about the sound, if it's disappearing or vanishing, even though it's continuous. So since any, every, mo every moment, this next moment is gone, so this is also a way to see how the sound is mm -hmm. vanishing, even though it seems to continue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have to repair it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it. Okay. Well, okay. <coughs> Um, my question is, is it important to believe in previous lives and future lives? Mm -hmm. Buddhism say there are previous lives, there are future lives. Modern science says there is well, only this life, there is nothing at all. I said in between, the only thing I can say is, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> That's maybe where you want to sit. <laughs> Generally speaking, if the mind is infinite, it can't come to an end, otherwise it would be finite. So all the discussion, and there'll be more of it with even with Saraha about space, becomes meaningless. Then you're stuck with entities. I am a thing. I have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Both you and I are probably a little bit past the middle. We're heading towards the end. <laughs> That's our life. What, what was before? I don't know. What, what will come after? I don't know. I'm just in the middle passage of something. When we look for the mind, we see memories which can seem to have a shape, thoughts, feelings that seem to have a shape. <clears throat> Each of these is arising and passing. So we have shapes em <clears throat> emerging into the space of the mind. And then when we look for the mind itself, as with the five questions, we can't find something. So if our honest investigation has not been... Um, infected with some dogmatic stance, if we haven't been looking for what we believe must be there because we want to be good Buddhists, if we've honestly looked again and again and again and we truly see oh, this mind has no shape, it has no top, no bottom, it doesn't come from anywhere, it's not something that is actually staying anywhere, everything seems to be staying in the mind as moments of experience then how would this infinity come to an end? If it doesn't have any form, if it has no shape or color, if it is not an existent, it will not end. The exist seemingly in <clears throat> the seemingly existent forms arising and moving within it, they come to an end, but it doesn't come to an end. But it's not permanent as a self, because when you look for the mind, it's not anything. So, well, if we took a, 
as an example, it's not the same, but if you took the example of the earth, in the springtime there's wildflowers and planting and then you have summertime and everything's coming up and then there's the beginnings of autumn and the changing that everything's drying out moving into late autumn <clears throat> the leaves are starting to come off the trees and many things die and go back into the earth and in some places it's just like earth in the winter because everything all these small growing things, they're just gone. And then spring. And then spring. Because the mm. potential is in the ground. So in Buddhism they're saying exactly that. Although when the potential is in the ground, you don't see them, you just see, or you don't see, but there's just emptiness. This is not a dead emptiness, it's not a, a nihil void, a, 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 a dead, dead void. It is a plenum void, although the, vi the incredible diversity of the possibilities of this full potential are only revealed moment by moment. The potential is there and is activated according to circumstances. So, Dying is autumn into winter, and the first stage of the bardu is only winter, nothing at all. And then you have spring, you have the peaceful deities, the wrathful deities, and then you have summer, born into a, a body, a new life going along, and then you have autumn and winter, round and round and round. The text it says you can have liberation in winter which would be liberation in the Dharmakaya. Or you have liberation in spring, which would be liberation in the Sambhogakaya through the peaceful forms or the wrathful forms. Or you can have liberation in the summer, in which you are Nirmanakaya moving in this field of manifestation. So that's, if you like, theory. We will know if it's true till we get there. Yeah. So. In Buddhism, three forms of proof. <laughs> Direct perception, I see the fire. Valid inference, I see smoke. No smoke without fire. And the third one, the special one, the words of the wise. <laughs> now, if you try to say that in a Western university in your logic exam, <laughs> failed. <laughs> But that would be because we believe that the great sages, the great yogis, they have the wisdom eye, which is not awakened for us, and they see things that we don't see. You pay your money and you take your choice. <laughs> I don't, there's no way to prove these things. However, I think if you do a lot of practice, you start to see that I am emergent. If I was a thing, like a tomato, I'd appear to be a, de a definite thing, but you leave the tomato on the table and it starts to rot. And then it becomes all mushy. So, tomato as entity is actually tomato in process. From the first flowers coming out on the tomato plant, to green, to ripening, to pluck, to being on the plate and now rotting away. So although I take myself to be a thing, and that's a feeling tone, and it seems real, I am actually process. And the process has no clear beginning and no clear end. It's a process handed on. Even if you see it in Western terms, when your parents have sex and the energy of the sperm and the ovum come together, this is a transmission across time because they got it from their parents and their parents and their parents. So there's a sequential transmission of the possibility of life. If you are like Robinson Crusoe, washed up on an island and you're very lonely, uh, you might find a tree and put your penis into the hole in the tree and fuck away but you wouldn't have any baby. 
you've got to have the male and female essence. It's a French writer. I'm trying to remember his name. He wrote a he wrote a book called Friday or the Other Island, and that's what he describes. And when when Fra when, when Robinson Crusoe gets really excited and he's having a go in the in the in the hole in the tree, it's actually a, an a, an an ant's nest, and they start stinging him, and he's outraged. <laughs> the things we learn in the, in the course of our journey through life. <laughs> so we have all kinds of experiences and they pass and they pass and they pass. You, for sure you have lots of memories about things which don't exist. But because they're your memories, they exist for you, sort of exist for you. They inform you, they're part of your life. And that's so interesting. Maybe I'm informed, formed on the inside by ghosts, by memories. So my existence is full of non-existence. Well, mm -hmm. so maybe I'm not as solid coming from birth to death as I think I am. Okay. It's on. It's not on. It's off. It's off. Yes. Switch it on. Yeah. Aha! Hello! Yeah. <laughs> it's only about language. Um, sometimes you use the word dissolve and sometimes vanish. Mm -hmm. Does it has a cause and it has mm -hmm. which cause? That's all. So when the wave dissolves back into the ocean, it vanishes. <laughs> <laughs> that one was easy. It's easy. <laughs> Okay, enough? Enough. Let's continue with the text. So we are on the English version, page 15, section B, meditation. So he's saying that with awakening there is no object of meditation and no meditator. This even more subtle forms of subject and object are dissolving. Inasmuch as space is not an object for space, emptiness likewise does not make meditate on emptiness. So, there is no boundary in space, there's no division in space. You can't say that the space over Germany is having a conversation with the space over France. They're not entities. Space is indivisible. Emptiness likewise is indivisible. Therefore, you can't have subject emptiness meditating on object emptiness. Emptiness is whole, entire, undivided, unborn, unseparated, unisolated. So emptiness doesn't need meditation. I mean, what he's doing here is he's um, <coughs> He's saying, uh, to, particularly because he's, he's singing this to yogis, he's saying, you yogis who are busy all day long, meditating, developing your mind, what are you doing? You say, the mind is empty. If the mind is empty, why does the empty mind have to meditate? Stay with the emptiness of the mind. So there's a subtle critique in this about the Lamrin teachings, that we need to make progress, we need to get somewhere. 
you have a room, you live in the room, different furniture can come into the room, you say some furniture is better than other furniture. This is your prison. Whatever furniture arrives in the room, it's the room which continues, the furniture vanishes. So whether you have bad thoughts, hopeless thoughts, sexy thoughts, vicious thoughts, don't take the transient content of the mind seriously and then spend your life trying to change it or improve it. That's what he's meaning by, by meditation. Knowing non-duality is like water and milk, meaning you have these two things, you've got a glass of water and a glass of milk, you pour them together and you can't find the difference between them. Both are liquid. They don't have a mutually repulsive internal inherent existence. When you pour the water into the glass, the glass contains the water because the structure of the surface of the glass doesn't absorb water. And so you have two things. You have a glass with water. But if you pour the water into milk, they merge. So in that sense, non-duality is not two. Generally speaking, we say it's not one either. He's, he's talking here about uh, the lack of resistance in the merging of water and milk. So he's, he's, he's not giving a total account of non-duality, but he's highlighting the fact that because appearance is not other than emptiness, whatever appears in your mind is empty, therefore don't react to it. When you have horrible thoughts or you get lazy and you fall asleep in the meditation, sleepiness is an emergence inseparable from emptiness. So if you always fall asleep when you meditate, you can just sleep. People do sleep. It's not a criminal offense to sleep. But I want to stay awake. Why do you want to stay awake? Some yogis spend years meditating. <coughs> Kalu Rinpoche used to tell this story of two yogis who lived apart. And one was always drunk and the other was always sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> and what? The one who was always sleeping was in this dream yoga in which he was carrying out conversations with his friend. You, you can't know from the outside. The outer forms belong to conventional truth, where we have rules and regulations and hierarchies of evaluation. How should somebody live? What should they do? I'm getting old and I'm tired and I have many, many projects to do. And I often think of Sialama. Uh, he actually didn't do very much. And certainly as he got older, he left total chaos in his papers. They were never sorted out. They probably never will be sorted out. A lot of the handwriting is very difficult to read. Even he himself couldn't read his own handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so there's all of this stuff. And I think, oh, I should sort my papers out. I think Richard didn't sort his papers out. He died with a mess. He was clear, but he left a mess. <laughs> I'm a mess, but maybe my papers will be clear. <laughs> so you have to think, well, what is my obligation? What should I do with my time? Well, clearly, the main thing is be present. It doesn't actually matter. I mean, if your papers are a real mess, if your family or whatever can't be bothered, just get a house cleaner and stick it in a van and take it away and dump it. It didn't need to be sorted. But it's really important, and if I did that, that could maybe be helpful, and maybe, and maybe, and maybe. These are thought constructions. And while you're making books and doing all that busyness and fighting with printers and so on, clock's ticking, grim reaper's coming with a scythe. I'm in the next field, be with you soon. <laughs> <laughs>
what should I do with my time? This is at the heart for, for each of us. How would I live? What is important? There's always a lot to do. And a lot of what we do is not integrated into emptiness. We don't experience it as the luminous moment of non-dual revelation. What are we up to? So you have wisdom and you have compassion. If you've got too much compassion and you feel an obligation to do things, you can lose the emptiness. If you stay with the wisdom of emptiness, maybe these things are not so important. And for each of us, working out what that balance is, 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 uh, yeah. is lonely. Nobody can tell you how to live. Nobody can tell you what to do. And when you think of Tibet, all the monasteries destroyed by the Chinese, there is a huge new wave of oppression in Tibet. Very, very tight control of, of life there very limited education available in Dharma, lots of young men being forced to go and work in China and speak Chinese all the time. What's happened to the Uyghurs over in the, in the west part of China is certainly going to happen to the Tibetans. You have a racist state of hand domination. And the Han people will control absolutely everything. And they regard these tribal people not as the great family, as the propaganda says, but as inferior beings. It's not, it's not a good situation. We see holy people tortured to death because other people didn't see them as holy. We think these are great scholars, this book is beautiful, it awakens people to the truth, it makes them more ethical. We see these values and other people say, nonsense kill them. This is it. We are in the realm of the unestablished. Everything can change. The Indian government is changing its policies. Much more hostile to Muslims, much more hostile to Christians. In the future, potentially quite hostile to Buddhists. Hindus believe that Shakyamuni Buddha was one of the ten main avatars of Vishnu. As long as that, <coughs> excuse me, as long as that's the wrapper, then somehow Hinduism as a big non-conflicted family can include it. But there are particular brands in Hinduism as well. This nationalistic Hinduism, uh, which is going back to some primordial purity, which then makes them very sensitive to these other groups. So, Whatever we have to remember, whatever we construct will vanish. All we've got is this moment. We're here today. None of us know, shall we ever meet again? We don't know how long we'll live. So staying alive for the moment and being present is the most important thing. And that's what he's pointing to here. Water and milk. They meet. We have this moment, this conjunction, this patterning. Are we here or not? How should we be here, thinking about it, reflecting on it, or just being here, being present? Diversity has one taste, uninterrupted great bliss. So diversity is all that can be possible. Laziness is not different in its fundamental taste from being a good person, being a citizen, helping the poor, protecting the orphans, and so on. On the level of differentiation and hierarchy, of course it's better to be a rescuer than a persecutor. In terms of the ground and the illusory nature of phenomena, it's just one taste. Now you need to be very careful, but what we've touched on before is the ground itself is ethics. If you are in touch with this momentary experience, insubstantial, you're receiving light, color, you're relaxed and open, maybe you're helping in the kitchen, there's movement around. You go to the drawer, you take out a knife and you're cutting up the bread. You turn around, you hold the knife and you stab someone in the eye. 
Why would you do that? Why would you stab someone in the eye? Why would you do something bad? What is the energetic formation that would lead to that? Some hostility, some opposition, some feeling I need to annihilate you, I need you not to exist. That's very, very dense. That's very contracted, isn't it? I hate you. I hate you. You mean it con it's contracted, your muscles in your belly. Fuck you, you bastard. It's like that. Space doesn't contract. The wind moves. The winds of desire, the winds of anger, of jealousy, of pride, they move, they pour all through space. Space doesn't move. If your mind is inseparable from ground space, inherently ethical, kuntuzampo, everything's good. Ignorance leads to bad action. Ignorance leads to reification. You're real, I'm real. Leads to I like you, I don't like you, leads to bad actions. It's very, very clear. So that's what he's saying. Diversity has one taste and is uninterrupted bliss. And if you rest in that, you don't need to think and plan and try your best. You will find yourself in the connectivity, or, or rather in the openness of the empty ground and in the connectivity of the immediacy of diversity, you'll find yourself moving in harmony with the diversity. Mm. Ethics is inherent in the non-dual structure. So B2, <coughs> top of page 16, the supreme meditation inseparable from the presence of non-meditation. So he says, in this way, throughout all the three times, there is the limitless, authentic state free of mental activity. So by remaining open and present, activity moves through you. When we get in 15 minutes time to one o'clock and we stop, we go up to where the food's available. We walk one foot, one foot, one foot, one foot. We turn, we come to the stairs, up, step, step, up. Step, step up, turn around, like that. See, I've memorized it. <laughs> I'm not going to miss out on my dinner. <laughs> We're moving according to circumstances. When you walk on the flat surface, you can't continue when you come to the stairs. You do something different. You dance with the stairs. If you don't let the steps lead you in the dance, you trip over. Can't say to the step, come on, come on, I'm, this is what we do. No, 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 steps is. I'm the choreographer, it's my music, step according to the step. Yeah? So we are collaborating with circumstances. You don't have to decide, you see the step and you, yeah, that's what parents, Mothers are always saying to small children, look, will you just look where you're going? Look at what you're doing. Look. Because <laughs> they're caught up in the... So when you look, you have access to connectivity. It's not that you're making connectivity happen. You're actually in a web of connectivity. And when you're here... The connectivity carries you and you act according to that. That's the meaning of Lundrup, always connected. And so in the free flow of connectivity, as he says, there is limit, the limitless authentic state is free of mental activity. You don't have to keep thinking about it. You start to trust intuitive spontaneity within connectivity. Meditation, he says, is the conventional term used for the protection of this. Interesting. So the question is, well, why would you need to protect it? So he says, do not hold the breath. Do not mind, do not bind the mind. It doesn't need your help. It's already doing itself. That's what Lundrup means. 
take your place in this movement of phenomena which has been going on from the very beginning and you have always been part of this but you have self-isolated due to this web of conceptual uh, production of the pseudo isolated self-essence. Settle uncontrived awareness as you would a baby. So, baby is not sleeping. It is two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Mama is tired. Mama needs to protect the baby from the energy of her tiredness. You settle the baby by not disrupting it. Babies settle. They're activated by something inside them, which could be wind, it could be muscular tension, it could be teething, it could be all sorts of things. Sometimes you have to distract the baby. Sometimes you rock them. Sometimes you sing to them. You make sure that they're dry. If they're covered in shit, you clean them. You try to do it in a soft way that's not exciting so that they relax back. So between the baby and their sleep, there's some kind of obscuration. The tiredness should be the vehicle that carries the baby into sleep, but somehow they're not settling. There's some provocation. So as far as possible, you remove the provocation. You behave towards them in as unprovocative way as possible. We know sometimes when parents are very tired, they shout at the baby, they shake the baby. Babies are taken to A&E departments. They do a scan, they see all kind of brain lesions coming about from shaking because the parents are at the end of their tether. Relax and release. Relax and release. That, that, that's what he's saying. That awareness is non-dual. In that sense, it's always settled. When your awareness is not, it's not unsettled in itself, but because you're approaching it, from the position of a dualistic consciousness and you want to merge into non-dual awareness, there's a kind of density and impulse that you're bringing into the situation. You don't want that near a baby. Soft, gentle, what was saying? Be kind to yourself. Never blame yourself. Don't criticize yourself. If you fall asleep in the meditating or you're wondering about shopping or what's going to happen at home when you get there, allow these thoughts to come. Don't try to correct the mind. Don't bind it. Simply be with it however it is and gradually it settles. All of these things will vanish. But if you're active in trying to organize it, you're actually unsettling because you're giving dualistic consciousness a task. I need you to make awakening happen. Doesn't work out. It's already okay. Unnecessary effort won't help. Then he says, if memories and thoughts arise, look at their thusness. Their thusness what that means here, it's a, it's a term, denyi uh, or deshinyi. It means just this. De means that or blackness, dustness. When you conceptualize whatever is arising, you formulate it, you give it a particular form as we just looked before. If you stay with it, it means stay with the freshness of the emergence of this moment as it is, then that's enough. Don't try to correct or improve or change. Stay relaxed and open, and then you will see 
whatever is arising is inseparable from emptiness. It's your own positioning, your judgment, your dissatisfaction, your hopes, your fears, all of these slightly contracted positionings where you take up a stance, when you bring these into relation with the emergent moment, it is as if what is arising for you is an impediment, it's blocking you, it's a problem. So, as it says in the in many of the texts we have read in the past, may problems be the path, may obstacles be the path. So when you have a difficulty, this is always happening when I meditate, I get very tired, or I get very sad, I find myself crying, whatever it would be, stay with it, don't judge it, let that be your path. Well, how would I do that? by opening to its thusness, it's just this, don't cook it, stay with its freshness, its virgin nakedness, just here, and it dissolves. It becomes one in a link of chain signifiers if you link it, and you link it by, as it were, catching it, freezing it, taking it out of the flow of experience and then joining it to this chain of conceptualizing signifiers. You're thinking about what it is. Stay present and relaxed and all obstacles reveal themselves as inseparable from the ground and they are the path which leads you to where you are. So this is, this is there's nothing other than this. You can read Gampopa, you can read Maitri, mm. you read all of these people, they all say exactly the same thing. Don't go into reaction. What is getting to you is yourself. You are your own problem. You think it's a problem, it's a problem for you. Who is the one who's thinking it's a problem? Yes. Stay relaxed and open and everything moves through. Stop exquisitely wonderful and marvelous so at uh, two o'clock for those who are interested uh, we're going to take the uh, earth uh, treasure boxes which Anabila has kindly prepared and which people have brought some things to fill and do a small blessing for them and then they will be sealed and they can be placed in different places uh, also possible to continue with the work with the moulds. The key thing is to really press the clay in properly so you get more definition in the, in the detail. The moulds are very, very finely carved, mm -hmm. uh, but you just need to get the, the clay right in. So don't put on too much oil, just enough to give a, a protective patina and then put some clay on the back when it's pressed in. Take it off, we can trim it. And we put this into the earth. Now you can say, well, that's very relative truth. We've just been talking about this non-dual self-dissolving world. But this is also a world of forces. And the space is open to the movement of forces. There are forces of hatred, there are forces of exploitation and cruelty. So what we're doing with these uh, two activities is that we're just making a slight gesture to influence the patterning of winds that are blowing through the world. We're, we're blowing blessings into the world. We're blowing hope and light and truth into this period of darkening storms. So, we could do this with awareness, and it's beautiful. Now we have to break for lunch, so that will be at 2 o'clock at the back, and then uh, we meet here again at 3.30.
So when you're doing some practice with the pots uh, in the break, there's a recollection that we don't live in a country that has many symbolic uh, reminders of meditation or Buddhist practice or things that will bring us back to ourselves. <coughs> So we perhaps need to move away from formal symbols to the informal. So the weather has changed. We feel different. What you feel like, what you feel like doing on a chilly, wet day is not the same as how you feel or what you feel like doing on a hot day. Dependent origination. It's not theoretical, it's not abstract, it is given to you by all the changes that are around. So the more we feel ourselves as in dialogue with the environment, as participants with the environment in the co-emergence of the unique specificity of this moment, the less work we have to do. We don't have to remember because it's being demonstrated and shown to us. <clears throat> of course, what we see in a situation like that is a simple appearance and then we're cooking it a little bit for our purposes. We're drawing a lesson from it, so we're thickening it. And sometimes that's, sometimes that's necessary. We looked in the morning a little bit at uh, these uh, changes in public policy in Britain towards, uh, in particular, men staring at women. That objectification is a violence to the integrity of the ego self. So, it's again, it's very interesting with babies. Some babies are very open to contact, some aren't. But even with babies who are very open to making contact through their eyes, what seems to work for them is a present gentle gaze if you stare at a baby and stare into their eyes, usually they really don't like it. They, they want to move away from that. But if you have a relaxed, open gaze, free of demand, then they also kind of things start moving around between you. And that's the same between people. That if you sit with someone and you look into their eyes, if their eyes are opening to you and you're opening to them, then you have space encountering space. And if we are preoccupied, if we are anxious, for example, we'll probably experience that somebody's looking at me rather than opening to their open gaze. So this afternoon, with the lovely weather, if you feel like it, you can go outside and sitting with the sun behind you so it's not shining into your eyes, uh, sitting at a in a place where you have an open view in front of you and there's quite a lot of blue sky, focus into the blue sky and allow your gaze to open into the sky. And the emptiness of the sky allows your mind to empty into the sky <coughs> so that empty mind and empty sky are inseparable. So there you have awareness and emptiness manifesting without effort. And in, the, in Dzogchen and Mahamudra, moments when you can have a quick result without effort are best. Because whenever there is effort, there's intention, and when there's intention, there's duality, as we've touched on. So that's a very simple practice. Let the gaze rest into the infinity of the sky and the infinity of the mind meets the infinity of the sky. And then there's nothing. See little lights moving around, all kind of things are moving. 
but these are just like um, just like shadows. The space itself is not af affected. Okay, so we do the Guru Yoga of the White Heart. <coughs> Okay, so when you're sitting, <clears throat> especially on a hot afternoon, you might find you drift off. And then you're not drifted off. And that is incredibly useful because you were here, you drifted off while here. So you have immediate evidence. When I drift off, I don't go anywhere. <laughs> It is as if I go somewhere, but I'm always here. Therefore, getting back to here is very easy because you didn't actually go anywhere else. <laughs> the drifting off was an experience within here. The openness is the site of clarity and unclarity. When you are aware of it, then you have clarity. And if you go momentarily unaware of it, it's unclear. And you get caught up in a thought or a feeling, a little riff of ideas, and then you're here. So always try to settle just in that point when you're back. Don't think about it. Don't make a decision, I'm never going to do that again, or I must try harder. That's irrelevant. You're here. You've always been here. You're clear that you're here. It's always here. And then you can awaken to more and more possibilities of being here. You're here when you're sad. You're here when you're happy. You're always here. It's always appearance and emptiness, no matter how it seems. The seeming is an interpretation. The how it is, is the integration with the ground. At the end of uh, part B2 of meditation, page 16, and he says, the last line, do not think of water and waves as separate. So that's exactly what we're looking at. A wave comes up, you're in the wave, you drift off, it's water. The wave is water. I'm a wave. Wave and wave, waving together, a little commotion. It's still within. It is always within. All waves are part of the ocean. All mental arisings are inseparable from the ground. What then is the basis of judgment? This was a mistake. I shouldn't have done this. This was really good. I believe I'm getting somewhere. These are, again, just waves. Waves arising and vanishing. The semantic content, if taken by itself, will lead you astray. You go out in the field and you see some poppies. You think they're lovely. You cut the head off. Poppies don't like that. They die very, very quickly. 
poppy, stalk, earth, three friends. So in the same way, when you cut your own uh, manifestation off from the line of its expression, it gets fossilized, dried out, keep it fresh. It's just this, whatever it is. So then there are examples illustrating the Mahamudra path of unapprehendable ordinary mind itself, free of the three wheels. The three wheels are subject, object, and their connection. With Mahamudra, the non-activation of mentation, of mental activity, this, so he's saying Mahamudra is the non-activation of mentation. When mental activity is not aroused, that is Mahamudra. With this experience, there is not an atom of cause for meditation, so do not meditate. Well, if experiences arise and you get carried into loops of thinking, past, future, future and so on, when you see this, you're immediately freed from mentation unless you jump in with some counter comment, some interpretation. It's already gone. Whether it was good or bad, it's already gone. There is nothing to think about. So in that moment, when you come out of being lost in your thought and you're just instantly clear, this is Mahamudra itself. That's the first stage. If you stay with that again and again, you start to notice that even when I'm lost in the thought, this is Mahamudra, because I'm not doing the thinking. The pattern of the thought itself is swirling in the empty space of the mind, and for that moment, this is what there is, and then it's gone. So that clarity and appearance are inseparable. There's emptiness and appearance, but in between, as a mediating thing, there is clarity, which is just, oh. Nothing is giving rise to appearance, which is without self. And it's the absolute immediacy of the absence of inherent existence in the appearance. That's the clarity that shows it's the energy of the ground. So don't meditate. Don't try to improve your situation or make it better. If you are very easily distracted and your mind is going here and there, then many different experiences arise. We looked at before at the example of taking a hair out of a lump of butter. Without doing anything radical, very close to the experience, just ease yourself out of the merging. What is arising is not wrong or bad. It's not that it shouldn't happen. It's happening just a little bit close. Just a little bit close. You step back. So in London, Sometimes if I'm waiting to cross the road, I stand a little bit close to the edge of the pavement. Cars are going by, sometimes they come in very close, and especially bicycles can come in very close. If I step just a little bit back, I don't care what's going on. It's just zooming up and down because there's a gap. So that's all it's saying is if you have enough of a gap, you won't get touched. But you don't need a huge gap. So with the thoughts, if you get the big gap, it's because you're pushing them away. This, you're just rocking back a little bit. So maybe you're standing with someone and you're talking and it feels, oh, it's a little bit close. So you just ease yourself. <laughs> Hello, to carry on the conversation. You don't need to step back as if they're invading you. You just give yourself a little bit more space. That's what it means. So how do we do that in the mind? So 
you can do it with the Vipassana. But say, for example, you know, we've been sitting quite a lot, been sitting, many people sitting on the floor, body's not all that used to it. Say you get some sensation of pain or discomfort when you're sitting with that. It, it seems to manifest a bit stronger and it's getting to you. <coughs> How do you position yourself towards it without trying to run away from it? It's sort of there. You give it a little bit more space. It's still arising, but it's losing its power to hook you in. Does that seem to be the case? So it's, that, it's just like that. You're just easing back a bit. You're not really going anywhere, but you're just, you, what you're doing is not tilting into it and making it very real. So it's that subtle, you can do, you could support that with the out breath. There's a little bit more space. It's when we, when you solidify the situation and then you try to do something radically different that you get actually a confirmation of the truth of the situation. The supreme meditation never separates from the presence of non-meditation. <laughs> <laughs> so, why does he bother saying these things? <laughs> so, the, what he's saying is the best meditation is the meditation which is so unartificial, so unimposed, so close to the ordinary mind itself, it's not really meditation at all. What it is, is just turning the light on. You just, oh, you're here, oh, so look, you lift your gaze and oh, it's a whole big, oh, we're all here. So you, you haven't gone anywhere, it's just being present with everything is the great or the supreme meditation because it's not a meditation. If you try to be here, if you construct something, the artificiality of it will become an obstacle because it's about receptivity. It's not about proactivity. It's not about I will make it happen. It is already happening. It is happening without you, but it's a very, very friendly situation. If you turn up, even if you turn up late, you say, ah, welcome. Now it's happening with you happens with you or without you. If you don't notice it's happening, it's all going on. You walk outside, bloody hell. Sunshine, flowers, trees, people, cars. I didn't do that. This is my world. Who made my world? It's all there. Mm -hmm. It's just there. It can happen with us. So the non-meditation is the non-interference with the inherent completion of how it is. It is always just this. And if you're here with just this, then that's the supreme meditation, which is not straying from how it is. Non-dual, not two separate things, not split in any way, innate, born into the situation, not coming from somewhere outside, but emerging within the taste of great bliss. Inasmuch as water poured into water has one taste, when you dwell in that way, in such a state, the mentation that desires objectification and grasping is no more. So, by the mind resting in its own ground, everything is with it, as we've, I mean, he's going to say, and all these other charming people are gonna say the same thing 10,000 times, 10,000 times. Because there's nothing much else to say, and they've got to say something. Remember <laughs> from the beginning, they've come to a party, they say, right, now it's your turn, give us a song, or oh, no, no, that's not a song. Come on, two or three words, put them together. 
It's a verse after verse after verse. It all says the same thing. It's open, it's here, it's this. Open here, this. Open here, this. So, water poured into water has one taste. It's completely merged without any difference. When you dwell in that way, in such a state, that is to say, when you dwell with non-separation in the non-dual state which is innate or intrinsic, with it has the taste of great bliss, that is to say, it's free of dissatisfaction, of excess, of lack, then the mentation, the mental activity that desires objectification, something to be there, and grasping, holding on to what's been objectified, is no more. Objectification requires a ground which is something other than me. If there's no duality, what would that be? When you and this room arise together, which is the actual situation, as we've looked now, for you to be you here, you have a sense of you. That is to say, you're experiencing being here. You're leaning a wee bit forward. You're a bit over this way. You're like this. <laughs> Everybody's doing something. How should we be here? However you come. So, in that positioning, this is how it is. What should be changed? Or oh, probably for your spine, it's not very good. It's better if you sit like this. <laughs> it's just like this. It's like this. However it is, it's like this. How could you improve this if you turn it into that? Why is that better than this? As we've looked, you can't compare and contrast. So when you stay with the innate, it's just this. It's just the complete circle. And there is no thing to think about. When you look around the room and you see people just as they are, imagine you were a hairdresser, a Buddhist hairdresser, an enlightened Mahamudra practicing hairdresser. Any suggestions? It's just that. That's how it is. Why would you want it to be different? It's just like this. But once you have a template, think, oh, well, you've got that sort of oval face. I wonder if perhaps we could just pull it up a little bit here. <laughs> Artificial. Artificial. That the actual is being perceived through a lens of formulated possibilities. <clears throat> That's what our life in samsara is all the time. Whether you're learning cooking, driving a car, whatever, some will have some suggestion of a quicker way or easier way or more safe way to do it. What you say here, if you stay with the immediacy of the emergence of this moment in the field, there is no object. There is no subject. Objectification is an artificial activity and if you don't enter into it, it's there's nothing to think about. It is perfect in itself. It's not perfect according to any template. It's just perfect in itself. <coughs> then he says, in terms of conduct, there are three aspects. Mahamudra conduct is not preset. Oh, for yogis of authentic non-duality, what entities are there to be adopted or rejected? There's a kind of rhetorical question. If you are resting in the non-duality of whatever is arising, what would be the basis of improvement or change? What should be adopted? What should be you get more of what should be rejected, what should be pushed away. So Saraha then says of himself, I neither hold to 
nor discard any phenomena. And so I do not say, you, my child, must do this. No advice on how you should behave. He's not saying you shouldn't drink, or you shouldn't dance all night, or you shouldn't live as a celibate, or you shouldn't have lots of partners. You're not saying any comment about conduct or behavior. If you are in authentic non-duality, there are no entities. So what entities are there that could be adopted or rejected? Your behavior is terrible. People are talking. <laughs> they won't like you if you continue like that. So lots of people have strong opinions. They think this is a, a dreadful way to behave, whatever it would be. That is a movement in their mind. That is mentation. Mentation does not modify the actual. Mentation creates its own delusions. When you see that, it doesn't matter what other people think. It doesn't matter what they say. Then he says, just as that jewel, the mind, is unreal. Unreal here means it's not a thing. Your mind is not a thing. If it's not a thing, you can't find it as something. Because So then you can't say it's big or small, good or bad, pure or dirty, helpful or unhelpful. There's nothing you can say about it. So the conduct of the yogi is unreal. It's not something you can talk about. No, it's nothing to be said. People say all sorts of things. Let them say. It doesn't matter. I remember one time in Shantiniketan, someone in the university had said that they should close down Siyar Lama's department, which was the department for Indo-Tibetan studies because they had almost no students. He didn't like to teach. He didn't like to go into the university. So he didn't enroll anyone. But there were two other people, a Mongolian Lama Chimba and a Bengali um, Suniji Kumar Patak. They also didn't have many classes and hot weather. Why would you bother? But anyway, somebody was complaining, was shelling out all this dosh. It's a nice building in the, com in the campus. We shouldn't continue it. It's just a white elephant. So then Sialama called me right when writing them a letter in praise of the white elephant. <laughs> in all Asian countries, the white elephant is honored as the vehicle that carries the jewel of the Buddha's mind. Kings in Thailand are celebrated as the possessors of whole herds of white elephants. Across the world, people honor white elephants when they come. If you wish to get rid of a white element, I suggest you leave India and go and live in a barbarian western country where people do not honour the white elephant. But we in this culture decided to do He didn't care. He didn't care. He, I mean, it's a very polite way of saying you're an arsehole. <laughs> but the message is underneath. <laughs> so it's like that. You don't care. Like, he, he behaved very strangely in many, many different situations. A lot of his activity was not very successful. He never cared. You just do what you do in the situation. It fits that situation according to how you see it. And that's it. It is what it is. Now, we do lots of performance reviews, go over the data, how could we improve what we're doing. We reify, solidify, and try to change it. And you say, but it's gone. You'll never change that. You might change this. This hasn't arrived yet. Do you know what, how it's going to come? Well, you don't know how it's going to come. And that's already gone. What are you going to improve? 
Are you here? Are you here? It's not, it's not the way in which a, a, an articulated capitalist economy functions, because we always have forward planning. Now, there's a lot more talk about building up stores of gas and oil just as a safety uh, buffer against the kind of events that, that can clearly happen. But this is about freshness. Then he says, although his talk is idle chatter and diverse stories, the yogi's mind does not stray from singularity. Singularity here means the completion, the complete circle, unfragmented of awareness and emptiness, clarity and emptiness, out of, uh, appearance and emptiness. When you leave school, you might be hopeful that that's the end of exams. <clears throat> but exams go on all through life because people are observing us. And if you get a job, you know, quality control, are you producing enough in relation to your pay, are you generating a profit and so on? Or if you're in academic circles, are you producing enough <coughs> papers that are published in accredited journals, that's all kind of evaluations that go on all the time. And, but here he's saying, although the yogi's talk is idle chatter and diverse stories, just blethering, just passing the time. It is perfect because it is inseparable from the ground. It's not a product. It's the bubbles on the water of the process of the flow of integrated existence or non-existence. So that's very interesting. It is intrinsically valuable, therefore it doesn't have to demonstrate value. If people don't think you have intrinsic value, then like an actor, you're only as good as your last review you can lose your place in the cast. You can be thrown out into the wilderness. Nowadays, with um, zero hours contracts, many people have no job security at all. They have no idea, month by month, how much money they're going to get. So they're never sure if they'll be able to pay the rent or not. This kind of ungrounding of the worker in a modern economy is an absolute abuse. It is contempt for staff. It is, it is ludicrous and disgusting. Why would workers have any loyalty to the companies they work for? Why would they? So, here he's saying, think what you like. I am not an object for your concepts. When you conceptualize about me, you're thinking about yourself. It's a self-reflective conclusion because you don't reach me, you don't touch me, you can't catch me. I am open, empty clarity. And I'll talk nonsense if I want. <laughs> Shia Lama was an expert at nonsense talking. <laughs> he could blether and blether and blether till the cows come home. He told me the same story thousands of times about being in Germany on a rainy day. It was a Sunday. There was no cafe open. And he saw people going to a hole in the wall and coming out with food. So he went over there and there were little glass boxes and somebody showed him you put in the money. And then you get something to eat, and he was very happy. He told me that again. <laughs> I'm thinking, no stories about Tibet, <laughs> the monastery, the teaching. No, 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 no. Let's talk about Germany on a rainy Sunday. Of course, I didn't understand anything of that. I'm just going, 
kind of bored and pissed off. <laughs> what I didn't notice is that he didn't get bored and pissed off. He was very intelligent. So why didn't he get bored and pissed off? Because if you're fresh, anything's fresh. I got bored and pissed off. You got things inside you, big Dharma things. Give them to me. Give me the tasty ones. Not a bloody story about an automatic food vendor. My conceptualization couldn't I couldn't get a handle on what he was on about. He wasn't on about anything, he was just talking with something. What he was doing, he was talking with me. I'm hanging out with him. I'm sitting very close to him. He's smiling at me, telling me this nonsense story, and I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't there. I was in my head. And that's really what it's pointing to. It's not the content, it's the connectivity. It's the there's an opening. It's just this. We share ourselves. You don't share yourself through the content of what you're saying, but the available. Somebody speaks, somebody listens, and it weaves back and forth. No, it's a, it's a this quality control that we have in our head and our kind of anxious, neurotic eating patterns of I can't eat that, I can't eat that. It's not helpful. <laughs> and then he continues. When he says the yogi's mind does not stray from singularity, this singularity means like this in entirety, this completion, this non-fragmentation, itself has no existence as one thing. So although the experience of the yogi is diverse, it's not dispersed, it's not fragmented or sprayed out into different things, it's whole but with endless permutations of variety within the whole, it's not one thing and so as the diverse appearances are without root, they're not a thing, they're illusion. <clears throat> like a madman, carefree and unconstrained maintain childlike conduct free of intentional activity. Appearances are illusion. Whatever situations you've been in your life, and some of you may have been in very wild situations, drugs, craziness, funny sexual things, loneliness, sleeping rough, all kinds of things happen to people in the course of their life. It's gone. It was intense, it was this, it was that, and it's gone. So like a madman who goes through all sorts of situations, carefree and also to an extent careless, let it happen. Just let it happen. Now that doesn't mean intentionally putting yourself in danger. Certainly not until you're very at home in non-duality. For people who are very at home in non-duality, there's ways of practice which are designed to get people to not like you. Because otherwise life would be too easy. <laughs> They're interesting. If you're the big llama, everyone kisses your ass. So many, many times the big llama behaves a bit badly so that people don't like him, or they doubt about him, or they gossip about him. And that gives him the experience of something different. Because otherwise it's just in this psychophantic, you know, you're the greatest, you're the greatest. And it's not true. When you're surrounded by people who say you're the greatest, remember Elvis Presley was not a good outcome for him. You need people to say, uh-uh. Remember this thing when these Roman generals got their victory parade riding through Rome in a chariot and there's always a slave standing behind them say you two will die you two will die you two will die isn't that amazing mm. this is an illusion today is your day just this day one day then who knows so mm -hmm. <laughs> Because you're sitting 
with the impermanence of situations, you don't need someone reminding you of that. You see the illusory nature, and here you are in it, and then it's gone. And in it, and then it's gone. And you can be fully present and fully allowing. It's gone when it's gone. So in that way, it's carefree. You're not trying to protect an edifice because something else will happen. So, <clears throat> then the next section is how to avoid being tainted by circumstances when behaving in this way. Wondrous. The mind is like a lotus growing from the mud of samsara. There is no fault that can in any way stain it. Food, drink and sexual contact bring pleasure, yet body and mind can also be tormented by them. So no matter what you make use of, be untainted, neither bound nor freed by anything. That is to say, always the middle way. Good things arise, pleasurable situations arise as emptiness. Bad situations arise as emptiness. If you stay with the emptiness of everything, you can have whatever kind of life you want. But if the sweet thing catches your fancy and you want more of it, and you're tilted towards the positive, and you're tilting away from the negative, you are off balance. And then he's saying, yet body and mind can also be tormented by them. You fall in love with someone, they're unavailable, you can't be with them, but I need them. You didn't need them before you met them. Now you need them because you've been cooking up some story in your mind and they're vanishing. So he's saying, you're pulled off balance by reification. This is really good, I need more. This is really bad, I need less. Rather than, it's like this and gone. It's like this and gone, whether it seems positive or negative. This is enormously important as we see in our lives. All of us, get into these hopes and fears and longings and anxieties. And the root of that is solidification, reification. This is real. I have a lack. If I had that, I would be fulfilled. This is real. I've got an excess of it. I need to get less of it in order to be happy. So you could, with all these things, he's saying, don't jump like a frog. Observe, see. This is how it is. Brothers, sisters, this is how it is. You know, it's not wrong, it's not bad. If you see that this is how it is, just tilt a little bit. Don't radically change your life. Don't blame yourself. Just notice, oh, I'm a bit of a sucker. I, I get pulled into this. Some people become workaholic. They do so long hours because they want their colleagues to think they're good or they need to earn more money or they want to get fame. There's usually some message. Could be you had alcoholic parents and as a child you were embarrassed that the house was a mess and you never had money and you couldn't go on holiday with the school because there was no money for it. But now you're going to hold it together and now you're going to never fuck up and it'll always be good. This is a very anxious message. You're creating a palace so that it will be rising high above the little mud hut that you grew up in. Where do you want to live? Your, your present is a conversation with the past, but the past is gone. You're trying to rectify an imbalance by tilting over in the other direction. So it's very good advice for reviewing how is your life structured. When you organize your time and your energy, what, what's it for? What are you trying to achieve? Do you want to improve, impress other people? Do you want to impress 
the ghosts in your mind. The Russian literary theorist uh, Bakhtin, he developed this uh, notion about uh, communication that in every speech act and in every mental act as well, there is a, a speaker, an addresser, somebody who's doing the, the messaging, and an ad addressee. And when you're talking with someone, they may not be the addressee. The addressee may be your dead dad, or your mother, or even a teacher from school, or your brother or sister. There's someone who, according to your psychic <coughs> construction, is, an, is the important other, or you could have a whole range of them, and that when you are acting and daydreaming and speaking, in these dialogic actions, you're actually trying to address this person and say, I am okay, I am okay. And that's terrible. So you have to reflect, who am I trying to impress? Whose approval do I need? What structure? It could be a spiritual teacher, a worldly teacher, it could be a dead person. Because that puts a distortion into your organization. If you're longing for an approval you felt you never got in life, you're quite vulnerable. Because you end up volunteering for things. Oh, yes, I'll go on the committee. Oh, there's a mailing list. Oh, I don't mind doing that. Okay. The people who do that, you can see they're not doing it for the organization. They're doing it for some structure in their mind. And organizations who can very gladly, it's great that you're willing to give so much time. We really appreciate it. So, it's as if that voice is the voice of the addressee. So what he's saying is careful, careful. Be aware of the motivation of uh, all communication. Because no matter what you make use of, be untainted, neither bound nor free by anything. But if you don't know, the actual status of what you're engaging with. So, for example, you might take a lot of drugs because you want to be free and you believe that the drugs will make you free. Free from what? Maybe free momentarily from petty bourgeois preoccupations. <laughs> free from being a construct of your anxious mother's mind. It could be all sorts of things mm -hmm. like that but you're then still bound by the need to break free. But you're already free, according to the Mahamudra teaching. You're already free. So what is it you're escaping from? What is it you're escaping to? And it's in these moments that you, you can feel the projectile force. If you've ever been really, really sick and have engaged in projectile <laughs> vomiting, <laughs> <laughs> then you know what that's like. You feel it in yourself when you feel desire or anger or the need to mobilize like that. It's like that. It's like this huge wind is roaring through you. You say, whoa. Whoa. How can you be a spontaneous yogi just being part of the flow of experience if you're driven by these great waves of unresolved intentionality or unresolved rage at how I was not allowed to. So many people who destroy them, their lives, destroy their lives trying to escape from prison, and a smaller percentage probably destroy their lives in order to punish the one who put them in prison. I will never ever give you the satisfaction of being proud of me. All your friends will know that your child is pissing himself in the street. A lot of, quite a lot of people do that. I will live as a punishment to you. I will destroy myself publicly in front of you 
and everyone will know it's your fault. That's a not uncommon form of revenge. What a crazy agenda. I'm dedicating my life to punishing someone else, which robs me of the possibility of relaxation, fulfillment, awareness, awakening. Many, many people in prison have ended up in that situation. So, be untainted, neither bound nor free by anything. What are the vectors? What are the force fields moving through you? So then, spontaneous, desireless compassion benefiting others. With the carefree state of the uncontrived conduct of awakening, with this as your presence, when stupefied beings experience torment, the force of overwhelming compassion brings tears. So you find the ease, the carefree ease of just being at home wherever you are, because you're at home in the unborn ground of your being. When you're present like this and you see the stupefied beings, those who are made stupid by not awakening to how it is. When you see them experiencing torment, you feel this great compassion for them. Great compassion. If you're driving on the road in the sun, Idiot goes roaring past you, overtaking on a hill. Sweetheart, what do you want to do? You've got a big car with a big engine and you're a big prick. Weep, weep, what, what, what? <laughs> lost soul, so many lost souls. Proud of their body, proud of their new silk shirt, proud of their high heel shoes. Oh, you're going to die. You're going to die. How sad. You have no interest in who you are, but you're spending all your money to buy lovely clothes so that people will look at you and think you're doing well, and inside you're anxious and insecure. Why would we not weep? So that's what he said. And he's writing this <clears throat> about 1400 years ago. You know, this is village India. This is not, it's not in, the, in Paris someplace in a little boutique. So it's everywhere that people get lost. In this situation, he says, self takes the place of the other and true benefit occurs. So yesterday afternoon, we were doing the Tonglen, where self takes the place of the other. I will receive your sorrow. I will give you my happiness. And then true benefit occurs. We get the benefit of being able to pulse between empty with joy, share it, empty with misery, dissolve it. And we believe that true benefit goes out because we're open to every person, however they are. Analyzing the true actuality, one is free of reifying subject, object and their connection. That is to say, Subject, object, and their connection arise as illusory forms moment by moment. It's not that you can get rid of subjectivity. You couldn't walk and talk and eat and sleep if you didn't have subjectivity. But it's an illusory formation. It's an apparitional form. <clears throat> Unreal, they are like dreams and illusion. So... Don't try, you don't have to block the form of your life. Um, 
if you have small children, birthday parties are very important. You've got to get the sort of things that they tell you is what all the other kids have in their birthday party so they can have the right things. It's what you have to do. But why do we get, why, why are we doing this? Oh, because you want it and it's your birthday. Okay, we'll do it. Having some deep adult opinion about children's birthday parties is a bad idea. <laughs> they want a lot of sugar. They are going to make a mess. <laughs> so, like a dream or an illusion, don't fix a position. Don't be the one who knows how it should be or what should be. Try to work with the circumstances because the goal is always contact. If everything is one circle, if the field of experience, this field here now, arises all at once, if we experience ourselves in connectivity, and it's quite a good idea to be connected, then connectivity is what we're on about. So our goal is always, how can I make contact with these people? So we talk in different ways with different people. <clears throat> then he says, being free of desire and involvement, one is happy and free of sorrow, like a master magician working with the truth of illusion. The truth of illusion. You have children and they say, I want to go to Disneyland. <clears throat> it's tempting to say, Disneyland is a plastic ripoff. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. What would you like to do? When would you like to go? Shall we go for 10 years? <laughs> Should we move there? <laughs> the child wants to go there. So he's saying, like a master magician working with the truth of illusion, especially with children, they believe in these things. Children get hurt so easily because somehow their desire or their wishes have been poured into something we might think is nonsense. The number of ridiculous, highly expensive plastic toys you have to buy for Christmas. But the child wants it. So, like a master of illusion, they believe it's important. Abracadabra. Oh, this is wonderful. Gosh, look at this. You believe it too. You cast yourself under a spell. This is all he's saying. In any situation, if we want to have connectivity, we have to enter the world that the other inhabits. It is an illusion. If you stand on the threshold and say, I don't think it's a good world, how will you connect with them? If you take the Bodhisattva, Baba, I will help all beings. I will do whatever is required. But if we do the long Bodhisattva vow, that's what you say. For as long as it takes, I will do whatever it takes. Ah, ah. Buy more plastic. <laughs> oh, I don't agree with plastic. <laughs> I think I could just make it with straw. <laughs> Children want plastic. These are ethical dilemmas of the modern family. It's a drama. It's illusion. So this is, this is really question about what is your plasticity in being for the other. When you find yourself holding a position and say, uh-uh, is that because the activity is unsafe, in which case that's probably quite wise? Is it because actually functionally you can't afford it? Sadly, that's also a kind of reasonable limit. But if it's just because you don't like it or you don't think we should be doing this and there's no real danger and it's not enormously expensive, there's an imbalance. You have more power, you've got the money, and so they can't have it. So it's very interesting to think, shall I be adaptable? Shall I enter their world? Shall I prioritize empathic attunement in order to make them feel seen and welcomed? 
what is it that all human beings want? It's to be seen and welcomed. When you pray to Padmasambhava, you imagine he's looking at you, he's smiling, he's saying, hey, hello there. <laughs> Would you like to try my three lights? They're very bright and very nice. They're always fresh. I have a store of them here. Oh, how is that? <laughs> ah, now that's a different one. Red. <laughs> then you're connecting. You've got to do that. If you don't believe Padmasambhava is like that, it's boring. You're going into the playground of a mandala. You're going to play. He's a playmate. He doesn't take it too seriously. Mm -hmm. I remember with uh, Kanjuri Bachi Alama uh, up in Darjeeling. There's not many people. He was in, always in a tiny room. He did a little high chair. He was a huge, big guy. He's very old and he had long wooden stick with a metal point on it and he was giving this initiation about maybe 10 people there and this young western guy was there he was very young maybe 17 i think he was probably the child of one of the western people who was there and uh, he took this bumper pot and he's pouring it over him, pouring it over him, completely soaking him. And then he got his cup of drink, he wanted to pour it over him, a jug of water, he poured it over the floor, it's completely wet. Everybody's roaring and laughing, the young man's laughing. It was so connected, so inclusive, it's just exquisite. That was just sudden urge, he wasn't always like that, he was quite a serious man. But it's, it's, to allow yourself to feel the energy of the moment and go with it. So important. What inhibitions might you have inherited from your childhood or you know, your cultural training? Can we release ourselves from them so that we find the, the moment of connectivity? Okay, uh, the weather is good. The sun is not so high. I would suggest, if you like, go outside, go up the hill a little bit. Um, Maybe given this, the bugs that are around, you don't go to very long grass. You could take a, a cushion and just sit with the sun behind you, looking out into the open sky in front of you. You don't have to do any practice, although you just relax, you're sitting, you open your gaze into the depth of the sky, right into the depth of the sky, and just sit with that. Just sit. Let the emptiness welcome you. Okay. Now you could do that for a while. And then we go straight into a break. And then we are back at whatever it is, half past five. <clears throat> okay. Section three, the immediacy of Mahamudra. This has three sections. A, the certainty of gaining the result. The nature of space is primordial purity without the least entity to be gained or discarded. Everything which arises is in the space of the mind. There is no other source. Because it's arising in the mind, it has the nature of the mind, which is emptiness, just as whatever appears in the mirror is the nature of the mirror, which is empty. Because of this, there is not one single self-existing entity, and therefore there is nothing to be gained, to be held on to, or distracted. So whenever you see things which seem to be self-existing, you are seeing your own mental activity. The mind separates the field. The mind invests entities with existence. It then attributes qualities, positive, negative, neutral. And this becomes our samsaric experience. From the very beginning, this has never actually occurred. It's simply delusion. So he says, 
non-activation of mentation is Mahamudra. So you have a capacity to think, to develop thoughts about something. If you don't activate this capacity, that is Mahamudra. So we go right to, back to the beginning. The ground of everything, the ji, the base, is the ground of both samsara and nirvana. The ground of ignoring, confusion, delusion, attachment. This remains as a potential which can be activated. Who activates it? Ignorance in the form of I am a self-existing person. When it is not activated, this is Mahamudra. Everyone with a mouth has the capacity to smoke cigarettes. It's a potential which is in the body. Everybody with the capacity to hold something could stab someone. It is in the potential of the body. If it's not activated, it doesn't cause any problem at all. But it is there as a potential. Samsara and Nirvana have the same ground. When you realize that the ground of samsara and nirvana is empty and you remain with that awareness, there is no basis for thinking about things which don't exist. <coughs> what should we call the child of this infertile woman? What should we call the child? She hasn't had a child. She's not going to have a child. That's not fair. At least she would have the name of a child. What would you call that child? Jesus. Yeah? It's like that. It doesn't, the possibility, even the possibility doesn't exist, and yet you could imagine it. You could imagine it. These are imaginal forms. That's what samsara is. Samsara is demented imagination. It's imagination under the power of duality. So we imagine all kinds of things. We imagine friends, we imagine enemies. Some people will probably imagine that the next Prime Minister of Britain will be a great person. <laughs> people imagine all sorts of things. They are imagined. It is as if they are real, but they are not real. But if we are in the theatre of believing in the reality of that thing, then it becomes operative in its delusion. Yeah. We mobilize according to our belief. When we had the uh, annihilation of communities in the Second World War, when there was a belief among several people, many people, no gypsies, good, no Jews, good, no crippled people, good, no homosexuals, good. These beliefs led to activity and to murder. It was a belief. The mobilization of beliefs is dangerous, even if the belief is crazy. Even if it's madness, even if there's no true basis for it, substantial basis for it, even if someone with any degree of rational thought could think, <laughs> whoa, what are you doing? Where are you going with this one? When you immerse yourself in that belief, it seems true. So we had in the Caribbean, I don't know, 20 years ago or so, this Jonestown massacre where this cult leader had set up this community with about 800 people. And then they developed, as most cults do, an increasingly paranoid approach to the outside world. And then they went around handing out these little cups of juice 
with poison inside and parents were poisoning their own children and then poisoning themselves because it was better to die by their own hand. Nuts, crazy, but people believed it. So that's uh, the activation of mentation is Mahamudra. If you don't activate these crazy ideas, you have the freshness of the open moment that we see all over the world. For example, the World Bank is full of mad ideas. Let's build a dam. Let's build a dam that will allow one country to, to deprive other countries of water. Mm. Good for Ethiopia. Egypt's not particularly happy. So it says, so do not discard anything for the sake of the result. So if, if you conceptualize through your own mental activity some notion of what enlightenment would be like, some notion of how you will be like in your pure state, then on the basis of this elaborated conceptualization, you think there are qualities I need to develop and there's others I need to discard. She said, don't do any of that. Because when you think there is something to be discarded, that is itself diagnostic. When you feel that, that is showing you directly you're out of touch with the actuality. You have entered into the deluded realm of duality. You're thinking that your problem is strongly real and therefore you won't be free unless you stop doing it. That's a sign. So don't discard anything. The mind that hopes has been unborn from the very beginning. So what could there be to be discarded or gained? Means if the mind, if the mirror is empty, you look in the mirror, you can't find anything. The reflection arises in the mirror, it's the same. The ocean has been water from the very beginning. The wave is water, not anything else. The mind <clears throat> is empty. The thoughts that arise are empty. Why would you try to get more empty? Why would you try to get less empty? Oh, it's the wrong kind of emptiness. <laughs> oh, that's the best kind of emptiness. Hey, where did you get that empty? That's a good one. That's fantasy, that's mental activity. People who like skiing talk with each other. Where's the best snow? Where's the best snow? Okay, interesting idea. If you're a surfer, international networks, where's the best surf this year? Where are the waves good? Waves are coming out of water, going back in again. You go, where's the best ones? Where's the big ones? The big ones are better than the small ones. Why are the big ones better? To get more chance of being drowned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more heroic. These are attributions of value. The wave is water. There is no way that one wave can be better than another intrinsically, because intrinsically, inherently, it's just water. These are formations of water. So the form of the water makes the water better? No, it makes it better for a purpose. It's not inherently better, it's situationally better. And if you're interested in situationally improved water, then you have to take your surfboard and travel. <laughs> if someone were to get something real, what would we do with the teachings of the four mudras? We might use the teachings of the four mudras in very big books to come up to the person who got something real and beat them to death for betraying the teachings of the Buddha, because we are the true believers. <laughs> Means it is impossible. It's simply a rhetorical way of saying you cannot find something real because of the nature of the ground. Because the first 
of these uh, mudras is the inseparability of all phenomena. So all the practices would be meaningless if emptiness was not there. But emptiness is there because there is no other base. So the second section here is the delusion of de desiring something when there is nothing to get. Just as a deluded mountain deer tormented by thirst races towards the water it sees in a mirage, so stupefied beings tormented by desire find that the harder they try, the further away their goal becomes. Can you imagine in the mountains, hot summers like this, the pools dry up, the deer are thirsty, and they see a mirage due to the heat, and they go chasing after it. And they can't get to the water because there is no water in a mirage. In the same way, when you are stupefied, when you are made stupid by lack of access to the actual situation, and you feed yourself simply the fruits of your own imagination, then you're tormented by desire for something reliable to get to the truth of things. In that situation, the harder you try to get the real, the further away it becomes because there is no reality. There is no water in a mirage and there is no reality in appearances. They are appearance and emptiness. And so, the goal is always unavailable, which is very, very sad. Gaining absolutely nothing is called the attainment of Vajradhara. So the primordial Buddha, who has never changed from the beginning, who holds the absolute inseparability of wisdom and compassion, he, to attain the, his level is achieved by gaining absolutely nothing. Unborn from the very beginning, the completely pure presence has not the least difference within it. Again, this is about appearance and emptiness. You look around the room, you see different people. We see difference, difference of appearance. What is the status of appearance? It is empty. There is no true difference between marked by appearance. There is relative difference marked by appearance, but it has nothing behind it. It doesn't refer to any individual essence. It is unsupported, unestablished. Discriminating mentation is pure appearance within space. So when you say this potato is better than that potato, both of these perceptions, both of these statements are pure appearance within space. They're not bad. They're not even wrong. They're just illusion. They are pure because although something has been stated, it has no referent. This potato, this potato is the best one. What is being pointed at? A potato. What is a potato, a concept? Do you find concepts in the fruit shop, the vegetable shop? Do you find it on a plate? The concept is in the mind. This potato is your idea. This woman is your idea. This man is your idea. They are not to be found. How will you compare one idea with another idea? By adding more ideas. By complicating the ideas. Ideas are intrinsically empty. Whenever you see something which is real, 
it is a confectionery, an imagined form developed in your mind on the basis of patterning concepts through mental activity. Nothing is created. That's why I said it's like a dream. In a dream, many things happen. You might be kind, you might be unkind, somebody might attack you, you might find yourself in bed with someone, you might find yourself in the toilet, you could do all sorts of things in a dream. None of them would have occurred. The dream seems to point to something, but there is nothing there. This is exactly what he's saying. This is called Vajradhara, <clears throat> a mere name. Even if you say Chenresi, a mere name. Aryatara, a mere name. My mother, a mere name. Mr. Putin, a mere name. Shakyamuni Buddha, a mere name. Whatever you name is a mere name because there is no actual self-existing referent for any linguistic term. The semiotic web mm. hovers in the air without touching the least entity because all entities are unborn. The birth of the entity is the delusion that the name applies to something. You believe in something, you believe it's true, you can point to it. That's the power of your belief. Whatever you believe is the case, someone will very likely believe the opposite because it's in established for you according to your belief. The mind is trying to prove that, the con that some contents of the mind are better than others. An idea says, I am the judge, and I can check the different qualities of these ideas. If you went to a potato sorting factory, they employ people in quality control who look at the potatoes. Imagine Monday morning, there's a queue of applicants outside, at the head of the queue is a large potato. Potato says, actually I have quite a lot of direct personal experience of being a potato. I think I am in the best position to judge these potatoes. That was like an idea judging ideas. It's already on the side of the potatoes. But if the potato is judging the qualities, of these are all marvelous potatoes. Yeah, we're all family members, you know, joined by tubers under the ground, you know, we know each other. Oh, yes, perfect potatoes, all of them. I wouldn't reject any of them. <laughs> Ideas are not to be trusted. Vajradhara is a mere name. If you think you find something reliable because it's real, no, things are reliable because they are inseparable from the ground. That's 180 degrees. That's completely topsy-turvy, upside down. It's not what you want from a car mechanic. <laughs> it's certainly not what I want from Lufthansa on Tuesday. I want them to be actually reliable in a simple, straightforward way. <laughs> we want <clears throat> reality in the sense that we can string ideas together and seem to activate by the use of these ideas actual patterns of phenomena. But when you look at the truth of it, that it's just another fantasy illumination. Just as with a mirage appearing in a dry desert, water appears yet there is no actual water at all. There is no Vajradhara. The Buddha is empty. The Buddha manifests qualities and they're all illusory. So we've got Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, Nirmanakaya, the Tibetan word for uh, Nirmanakaya <coughs> is Trupeku. And Trupa is linked to confusion and magic. It's quite a complex family of words. 
So essentially it means a magical illusion. It's an apparition, like, um, like a mirage. It's a formation which has no truth to it, and yet it has impact. The reason the Nirmanakaya comes into the world is to indicate that appearance is empty, there is no self-substance, there is no one to be found, and yet there is manifestation, because the source of the manifestation is not an ego essence, it's not some personal intrinsic ground, it is the ground which is empty. So, discriminating mentation is purified on primordial purity and cannot be spoken of as the duality of permanence and annihilation. It means the mental function that you have, developed it very well, that allows you to pattern thoughts, give them hierarchies, see how they correspond and disagree, This activity, all this activity that generates everything you know, your job, your pension plan, everything, whether you're a scientist or a liberal person or a postman or a teacher, whatever you do, all the things that you know to carry out your job, these structures are all purified on primordial purity, the emptiness of the ground, because that is how they, how they emerge. Just as a rainbow emerges in the sky, the sky is the setting for the emerging of the rainbow. So dreams emerge in the night, in the, in the absence of wakefulness, and all the different thoughts that we have emerge from the empty mind. And with that, that being the case, you cannot look at it well, you can, but it would be foolish to look at phenomena in t within the duality, the imagined duality of permanence and annihilation. So, if you go to Rome, even today, you can find ruins from the old uh, Roman Empire days. They seem to have a permanence. Of course, they have history. They're affected by the acids and so on that are coming out of um, modern burning of fuels and so on mixed with the rain. But they seem to endure. There are other things which seem to vanish very quickly. This is enduring. This is not enduring. What is being referred to? A concept. There are no things. There are concepts that are believed in. As with the wish-fulfilling jewel and the wish-granting tree, through the power of aspiration, hopes are completely filled. Why is this? Because when you see that everything is perfect as it is, why would you hope for anything else? What you get is what you get. Since you're not positioned before events, you can't say it's not what I wanted because you were present in the moment and there was no imagined future where there was some object of wanting. It's just this, it's just this. So you're free of hopes and fears and all hopes are completely fulfilled because you have no hopes except for this. Now, that might sound terrible. We have lived in times of incredible change in which people have said, don't just accept things, change them, make them work for you. Act and change things. The consequence of that attitude are spreading like wildfire in all directions like the sorcerer's apprentice, processes have been set in motion which we can't stop and which gain more and more power to alter things in ways we had never imagined. Acceptance seems to be 
the fate of the poor, the disabled, and the stupid. You just have to accept it. You're not powerful, you're not rich, and nobody cares about you. So just sup it up, suck it up. Not very nice language, but that's basically what's around. From this point of view, you keep trying to change things that are changing anyway. Are you crazy? Why are you wasting all this energy? Just be present in the moment and experience the incredible variety that's unfolding moment by moment without artificially constructing things which will, by their, their origin in your mental process, they will be of necessity impermanent and will vanish and you will be feel bereft, abandoned, betrayed. Don't do it. Moreover, this world is conventional only and within relative truth. That is to say, everything that arises for us is in relative truth. Relative truth means subject and object function together. There are two forms of relative truth. There's a very nice description of them in Simply Being or the Yogi's Handbag book. Pato Rinpoche shows how there's impure relative truth and pure relative truth and absolute truth. Impure relative truth is when the domain experienced due to the operation of dualistic thinking, self and other, is permeated by the energy of the five poisons. And so when you see something, you're immediately liking and disliking, wanting to get, wanting to avoid, pride at getting what you wanted, jealousy that someone else got what you wanted, and the turbulence of this is going on all the time so that you're reactive and ricocheting in, in relation to events that are coming. <clears throat> Pure relative truth is when there is still the power of dualistic perception, but <clears throat> the energy or the uh, distorting push and pull of the five poisons declines, and so I am doing this for this reason, but there's a, a simplicity and a clarity and the aim of my uh, activity is not inflated or distorted by my emotions. But it's still conventional. It's operating under the idea I exist, the situation in which I live is true, exists, and my activity is important and meaningful. That's all of that is delusion. So that's relative truth. But then he says, so you might then be thinking, okay, well, let's get to the absolute truth. That's going to be reliable. But he says, there is nothing truly existing in absolute truth. <laughs> now that could be a relief or it could be being kicked in the head again. <laughs> so <clears throat> there's nothing existing in absolute truth. Do I want something that's truly existing? Who would want something truly existing? Only somebody who was truly existing. And there's nothing that's self-existing. All created phenomena are impermanent. So if I want the existing, I'm dooming myself to an endless sequence of gaining and losing, gaining and losing. To, to truly exist is to exist in and of itself. But there is nothing like that. So what's... What's the point? What are we trying to get? We're not trying to get anything. You're here. This is it. This is it. You can imagine more. You can imagine different. You can even imagine better. If you then ask other people in the group, if they would agree with you that your better is the best better, <laughs> they would probably say, no. Why don't you try my best better? I think my better is better than your better. <laughs> because these would be fabrications, they would be ideas. It would be ideas. 
How is it? It's like this. How do you experience it? Directly and simply? Or with the added ingredients of fantasy? <laughs> if you see that everything is illusory, why would you add a dream onto another dream? Oh, so then you have simplicity, which is the second of the four yogas of Mahamudra. When things seem to be real, it's a confectionery. So when we were doing the body scanning, there's the arising of a moment. And if you catch it and separate it and add to it, it becomes something that seems to have a life of its own. But clearly, if you keep scanning, it's gone by itself. So you have created something which exists out of time. This is called Dr. Frankenstein's monster. It's artificial, it's a creation, and it's a troubled being. As, he, as the monster says in his misery, why did you make me? He's tormented. So we create all our constructions and believe in them, but there is no truth in that. It's like a dream. And at this happy point, it says, this completes the Mahamudra instruction, the Doha treasury. Oh, that's it. <laughs> Where's the happy ending? Where's the, where's the chocolate? I don't know. <laughs> it's deep chocolate, if you really see it, because what he's saying is, Grasping has very little benefit because you're always grasping at a delusion. Let's do the Guru Yoga. Again and again, you can see directly what you get caught up in vanishes. It's not there. When you judge it, you're not judging the actual, you're judging the trace of the imagined. So whatever arises in the mind, relax, stay relaxed and open, unpersecuted, and allow it to be as it is. So that uh, first text uh, is a complete teaching in itself. If you stay with that and study it, uh, many, many benefits can arise because it gives you just little gentle ways of supporting you in having micro responses to situation, not too strongly going forward, not too strongly going back, just subtly adjusting yourself and that keeps you more able to be relaxed and open however events are arising. And in the remaining time we'll look at some bits of 
some of the other texts. We would never get through all of them. So maybe take a, some moments and speak with someone sitting next to you and see whether the exploration of this text has been useful in some way. See if you can identify anything of value you got from it, or if you feel disappointed with it, or whether this kind of exploration is useful to you at all. See, see how, it, how your response for it manifests. So, <clears throat> see if that's given you any more sense of what might be clear, what might be unclear, what you think needs more uh, examination of or presentation of. See if you have any comments, any questions. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to add on um, the reply you gave to Andrea's uh, question. Um, in it's uh, of the quality of um, are we there yet, Daddy? Kind of, you know, and you know it. Uh, these questions happen. No? So, um, can, can I assume that as long as there's this lurking sense of existence in the background, as you said, on Andrea's reply, as soon as there's some of this still in me or in there, uh, <coughs> there's not yet a full sheer luminosity of the ground? Or is there another criterion on which I could see I'm there yet or not? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, these things are are difficult because we want to uh, gain the clarity of uh, separation. Everything is the luminosity of the ground. Despair, suicide, murder, rape, this is all the luminosity of the ground. Everything which arises is the empty illusory form. But the reason it takes it, what we would take to be the negative form is because its actuality, its truth as luminosity is not recognized. When luminosity is not recognized, it appears as things, as people, as friends and enemies. So, We are in this field of emergence, but we are, our uh, presence is obscured or veiled or covered or dulled, can appear in various ways by preoccupations, by habit formations that are imported from the past, sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously. And these provide a kind of basis for continuing dualistic perception. So we've talked of these various ways in which you might have a direct experience of the ground through the pet, some of the senzin or tantric dissolving, or the guru yoga, the white ah, in which you're just sitting and everything is arising in that moment. And so there is only arising and the arising is vanishing, so it's free of past, present, and future. But hovering around are these trace memories, which are available to be brought into play for making sense of what's going on. So there's two issues. There's obscuration as we go into the practice, there's obscuration in the practice and there's obscuration that continues after the practice. <laughs> so 
if I decide I am going to meditate, as I've commented several times now, this pre-positioning, I am the doer of the deed, I am the agent, already sets it up to uh, get in the way. There was a law, I remember in, I used to do some work in management trainings. We used to have these uh, residentials where managers would be taught um, Zen tennis, how to play tennis without thinking about playing tennis. And it was a revelation for most of them that if you don't plan and you just look where the ball's going and that's your sole focus of attention, your game improves. And when you think about what you're going to do and you're going to be competitive, it made the game worse because it was already solidified. So allowing it to happen, being part of what's happening, which inevitably is sometimes active as if you're the doer of the deed and sometimes reactive as if it's happening to you. But with these movements not made dense by a conceptual overlayering, then it gets lighter and lighter. But if you're looking for gain or for success, and you feel that it's all up to you, if you're a lonely hero, then it's more difficult. So it, we're not standard issue. Although we have the same ground, by now in our progression in samsara, we all have our own karmic traces and tendencies and hopes and fears. And so we each have to be with ourselves and observe how we cheat ourselves, how we tie ourselves in knots, which may not be the same as a partner or parents or children or boss at work or employees. There is a unique specificity to your manifestation in the moment and to the particular patterns of limitation that obscure you. So I think in, in that situation, every time you're sitting, you're sitting with the ground which is open, the manifestation which is the fruit of the ground, but we always have to remember the ground is not your best friend, your ground is not rooting, the ground is not rooting for you, it's not on your side, the ground is neutral and indifferent. The Buddha is on your side, but the Buddha is not the ground. The Buddha is the manifestation of awareness of the recognition of the ground. The ground doesn't care. The ground is truly that thing which is unavailable in any institution, an equal opportunity employer. <laughs> Space for everything. So that's what we experience. We experience all kinds of things arising. If we see the ground, the soul ground, the singular ground, everything partakes of the ground and is unborn from the very beginning. It partakes of primordial purity, kata. That's how it is. If you stay with that, then the thickening is not a thickening applied to illusion, it's just thick illusion. And whether illusion is thick or thin, it's illusion. That is to say, you could go uh, to the cinema and look at a comedy, and you could be laughing and enjoying, and then next night you go to a horror movie, in which you are very, very scared and you don't even want to look. Both are illusions. You chose to pay your money and go in. You relaxed in the comedy. You were open to all the scenes in the comedy. You are not having to turn away. But in the horror movie, you were. The horror movie is a movie. There's nothing more real in a horror movie. But you have that reaction. So. It is as if a horror movie is thicker or more dense or more real or more impactful than the comedy. But it's just an illusion. So 
that that would be the way in which one might be with one's uh, thick habits. And if you stay with them and you see that they arise and they vanish, the thickening, which is the accretion of conceptual linking, starts to fall away. Because it's, it's cumulative, it's added on, and then it falls away. If you don't keep adding it on, if you don't maintain it, it will crumble because it's an edifice, it's a construct. But just to say, oh, the mind is pure, everything will be pure, it's, it's not enough because that's a concept. You won't dissolve a concept by adding another concept. You have to actually see in the moment, this has no power. This is a movie. Now, we know we're pulled in the cinema, into the movie, into the film. It seems real. So we know that we can believe that things that are unreal are real, even in relative terms. This is our vulnerability. Samsara is imagined. Movies are imagined. Novels are imagined. Workplaces are imagined. Parents are imagined. Children are imagined. It's all imagined. But we think there is reality and fantasy. And you go to the movie and it's just fantasy until he starts cutting the person's face open and you see the blood coming out, taking out the eyeball and crunching it. And then the fantasy looks real. <laughs> and the hand that was poised over the popcorn is hanging there. <laughs> this is our mind. This is our mind. You're not allowed to make or show snuff movies. Absolutely illegal. So when there's killing in a horror movie, no one's being killed. Tomatoes are probably being killed in the production of the tomato ketchup necessary, but not people. So it's just observing these simple things that how we get pulled in and we become believers and then something arises in our mind and we believe it and it's the belief that makes it real. It's not real. So cultural formations are designed to promote belief because otherwise the audience wouldn't engage and they would tell people the show's crap. So there's a, we want to be taken in. The problem with samsara is, as we've looked already many times now, all the aspects of our childhood, our education, our the ways we earn our money, they're all affirmative of the separate reality of entities. Nobody comes up to you in the street and says, it's an illusion. <laughs> uh, there's somebody who lives near me who says, God loves you. That's about as wild as it gets in Kilburn. You know, <laughs> most people have just got their, their head down and they're off to the shops or going to work. They blank off everyone else. They're in the tunnel vision. They might as well be moles living under the ground. London is a, is a desert of human warmth and kindness. And that's because people are overwhelmed. It's all too real. And they're just in survival mode. So when that's the field in which we are operating, the field itself is fresh. But these flavors of anxiety come through, like going into the airport and people pack together and there's anxiety. Should I put on a mask or not? Everyone else is doing it. I should do it. There's danger. And of course, there is some danger. So how, what is the actual percentage risk of infection? Probably not very high, but it might, it might. So. When you see you are a creature of creativity and the create that so there's a there's a double move here. There is Sahaj, 
the immediate, the uncontrived, it is the creativity of the ground in which nothing is created, nothing is born. And then you have the creation of the mind under the power of duality in which we create things we believe to be truly real. The second is a kind of dark shadow form of the first. It's the Darth Vader of the mind. Once was good, took the wrong path. And so creativity in that mode is endlessly generating a particular kind of solidity. And that's what we, that's what we struggle with. We're all very hookable of, by hopes and fears, by expectations. Just releasing again and again, seeing how a bit like, you know, in this old, you can see these old films in Canada when they were really doing a lot of heavy logging down uh, from the, the hills. You slide the logs down the mountain into the water. And then there's these guys with spiky boots on and a big stick and they're getting the logs and lining them up. But often you get a log jam because logs go up the wrong way and it's very hard and dangerous work to keep the logs rolling in order to move them and, and position them. The thoughts in our mind jam together, like in a log jam. Mm. And we try what we can to loosen it up. You might, in the evening, you might be tired and you don't want to talk to your partner, but you just want to put on some music or watch some nonsense on the television. That's a way of trying to loosen the log jam in yourself to become a bit more available. the text is saying is that's a dualistic interaction and it cannot free you. You can change the pattern. You, you, you can bring a bit more optimal flow, but actually you're still caught up in, I have to make it happen. I'm the responsible one. Trust that if you don't move, it will move. It's a bit like a game that children make about who's going to blink first and you stare in their face. Or like in cowboy movies, who's going to shoot first. And if you move, you're stuck. If you don't move, you feel trapped. There's an anxiety that comes. It feels this is like this. This is unbearable. And so either you merge or you push away which is exactly the meditation instruction tells you not to do. Don't push anything away. Don't merge into it. Don't wait expectantly for what's coming. Don't look after what's just gone. Stay open in the moment. And that's, that's what we practice, but it's hard. And that's where this shadow sense of enduring existence lies <clears throat> and it will thin if we don't interfere with it but surely we could do something i'm sure there must be a computer there must be an app for it <laughs> i'm sure there will be Dokshen apps are coming you've got plenty of mindfulness apps Okay, any, was that text interesting? Yes. Is it useful? Yes. We're not going to get through all the other texts. We might do two short ones so you get a flavor of two other voices. Um, but, you know, you could, you could read Virupa's text, the, the, the next text. Most of it is fairly straightforward. If you've got a bit of time before we start tomorrow, have a read of that. I probably won't go through that one because it's quite long and it goes over a lot of the territory that um, the Sarah had texted. But um, the key thing is to find a way to trust that the meaning is available and if particular questions arise, uh, <clears throat> can send 
an email into the <clears throat> into the website and, and I'll respond. That is about our time for today.